Hello and welcome to the Gnosticast. The Gnosticast is where we go through each movie made by Studio Ghibli in release order and we discuss our analysis and research findings. Today we join together to discuss the, well, I guess second to last Miyazaki movie that was released until How Do You Live comes out, which might be the case before we are done with this podcasting series. Um, we are discussing today 2008's Gake no Ue no Ponyo. No, no, oh God, Japanese. Gake no Ue no Ponyo. Ponyo, my God. Or Ponyo <laughs> on the Cliff by the Sea. Much easier. I, I speak English a little bit better than I speak Japanese, which should be clear. Um, you can listen to this podcast on Lipsyn at nausicast.lipsyn.com or on Spotify if you want an audio version or you watch it on YouTube with a nice little loop in the background, which I assume most people do, but maybe not. Maybe we've already gone at some audio following. Leave a comment. Tell us about how you listen to this podcast. And with me today to talk about Ponyo are a few familiar faces, which I will now introduce to you. With us is Hipster Cthulhu. As the name suggests, I'm also a weird creature from the sea. Uh, <laughs> a weird creature from the sea that goes by which pronouns? Oh, I forget every time. He, him. Uh, Beautiful. It's on record now. Then we got a weird creature from the deep, dank catacombs. Platon Skull. Uh, hello. Yeah, that's me. Uh, I go by uh, he, him. Um, I didn't really prepare anything fun to say, so I'll just uh, I'll just quote Ponyo from the movie. <clears throat> Ham. <laughs> it's it's a powerful quote. It's it's, it's one of the best in the film. Mm-hmm. Then we have Tasu, which is a name that sounds kind of like Talesophobia, the fear of the deep oceans and waters and the creatures they're in, but not quite. So Tasu. Well, I'm afraid I'm all about water, but um, uh, yeah, I'm Tasu. I go by she they. I also am an artist. That's it. Oh, that's amazing. Um, you should actually tell us how we can find you on Twitter if some of our listeners want to check out your art. Oh, um, yeah. Oh, although I'm not sure if my contributions will be able to justify it, but, but whatever, here we go. Um, yeah, I am Tasu Ido on Twitter. That's Tasu, like like on the, on the screen you might see on YouTube. Uh, and then on the end... I R O, um, all in one word. I'm sure your contribution. I'm sure your contribution will absolutely make this a valid advertisement. So, and lastly but not least, we have Voiceflower. Hi, I'm Voiceflower. I go by she/her pronouns, and much to the to the delight of Ponyo, I bring the opai. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. Ponyo was really hyped about that, and of course. I am your host, Niad, he, him, as always. Let's get right into this movie. So, Ponyo is the film Miyazaki directed after he finished Howl's Moving Castle. And the production for Ponyo formally began around spring of 2006 as Goro Miyazaki's Tales from Earth Sea came... Oh, sorry. Came to a close. And the kind of story how... Miyazaki ended up deciding on this movie and figuring out what to do is a bit all over the place. As it seems like Miyazaki was stuck in a weird rut as uh, Toshio Suzuki reports about the creative process. There was uh, included in the Blu-ray version that I was able to watch, the German Blu-ray version, there was a cute interview with Toshio Suzuki where he details that how Miyazaki can be a little bit like a stubborn uh, you know, child when it comes to deciding on which topics, where Miyazaki will very passively hint at things he's interested in, and Toshio Suzuki then needs to go, do you want to make this? And then, only then, does Miyazaki say, well, yes, good idea. <laughs> Miyazaki and, always playing hard to get. Exactly. <laughs> very soon, did I? And And this seems to have been one of those cases. It also involved a sequence where Suzuki talked Miyazaki into uh, doing a vacation in a town called Tomonura, which then ended up the setting for Ponyo, like the seaside town in which Ponyo plays is heavily inspired by a vacation Miyazaki took in 2004 or 2005. I think both of them, which Suzuki forced him to go on 
<laughs> in order to, you know, reset himself, get some impressions of the real world and get the creative gears churning again. And, well, it is, it is quite... Uh, I, I really like the dynamic because it shows again that Suzuki kind of... Uh, it's like a, <laughs> almost like with parental guidance forces Miyazaki to go on a vacation he didn't want to hear anything about, and then that ends up being the setting for his next film. Well, <laughs> this is how it goes. I mean, that's also like just a, a good producer, like like knowing like uh, it, it, it. I mean, it's great as a producer to have talent that's like really workaholic, um, like constantly churning something out. But if it's creative talent, like it, it can become a, a, a liability. If 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 you don't take a break, you know, see see the world a bit. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, and as the creative process goes, Miyazaki being forced to go on vacation starts reading books, finds a book he likes, uh, finds the name Sosuke in it, and he already decides my protagonist is going to be named Sosuke. I couldn't tell if there's any deeper relationship to the book that he's read there, which gave him the name Sosuke, other than that. It indeed contained the imagery of a cliff, which is still a title of Ponyo uh, by the cliff, and uh, uh, the name Sosuke. But another thing that Miyazaki kind of complained to Suzuki about was that he, as a child, read uh, uh, Hans Christian Andersen's Little Mermaid, and that he had trouble accepting the premise. He explains that he did not like the idea, or did not uh, resonate with the idea that the mermaid protagonist did in fact not have a soul. He didn't think that was right. And I feel like he sort of set out to rectify a part of his dissatisfaction with The Little Mermaid in this movie. A ginger who canonically has a soul. <laughs> oh. That... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's true, there's quite uh, a few gingers uh, yeah. in here. I, I mean, I, I mean uh, Disney's The Little Mermaid, uh, she's also ginger. So so maybe that's where oh, yeah. it came from. Like yeah. there, there, are, there are certain parallels, but like... The adaptation mm -hmm. in Ponyo is very, 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 very loose, but like it, that that story kind of reminds me of like the the story behind Guillermo del Toro's uh, best picture winning uh, The Shape of Water, which like like came about a, a, as a result of uh, Guillermo del Toro as a as a kid watching uh, I think uh, the creature from the Black Lagoon and finding himself sympathizing with the fish monster. And 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 finding it's like uh, like sort of stalking of the female protagonist like weirdly romantic, uh, and and so like f finally got to make a movie that like rectified that. It's it seems to be like the same sort of logic, like taking taking these presumptions from from old, old stories and fairy tales and, and and monsters and like flipping them on their head to find some more human element to it. Yeah, I think it's and, that, a, and that's it's an, interesting an interesting modern thing. approach where you take these yeah, more like sympathetic aspects to the to the whole story and all the characterization uh, cuz otherwise, you know, if fairy tales are meant to be like simple and direct while this clearly in Ponyo and Del Toro they uh they want to expound upon why would people actually do these things as opposed to some kind of like larger metaphorical nature. And <laughs> it's interesting you mentioned creature from the black lagoon because um, in in this movie, we also have a fish creature that stalks um, a romantic interest. You you could say so. It could it could be a little bit of stalking. It, it, it feels it's more less, mutual it's, because it's, it's, it's stalking. It's more running, like you know, it's not sneaky in any way. Really huge yeah, <laughs> it's pretty ostentatious. Wife. That that that's perfect. This movie is like a metaphor for stalking. You know, you think you do it out of romance, but actually, you're like bringing a flood and despair and destruction upon oh, your shit. loved one. There's a whole other layer to this movie. I didn't even realize. <laughs> oh man, there, yeah, is. Uh, there really is. <laughs> gr gr gritty reboot of Ponyo, where Ponyo is the villain when. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, gritty reboot of Ponyo, where Ponyo is the creature from a Black Lagoon. Yeah. Yes. Like that Invisible Man remake that came out recently. Do that with Ponyo. <laughs> <laughs> Dooms all the earth to... But I think it's, it's yeah. quite noteworthy that we're talking so much about influence, because influence and sort of what stories are and how stories relate to other stories is something that Miyazaki's mind has been hovering around a lot as he was coming up with Ponyo and as he was doing interviews during the production of Ponyo. There was one interview in which he explained that he does not at all enjoy being called a creator because what he thinks he's doing when he's telling stories is not creating a story, but somehow just reusing things of other stories that already exist in a sort of new 
flow or direction. He doesn't think of himself as a creator, but simply as like a conduit of these other stories which have existed before him. And there's also a quote that is, um, when I work on a new story, I think I'm writing a new story, but when I scrape things away to its core, I realize that there are fragments of these old folktales or legends that form my stories. It's not that I'm trying to resurrect an old legend, but it naturally it's there at the core. I think it shows that I'm in the flow of human civilization. So there's an aspect to which he conceived mm. of the process of writing as tapping into an already existing framework, network, relationship of stories that exist. And yeah, but like, can, can can someone tell him that that's what all writing and creation is? Like, a, a, no creator <laughs> is like wholly original. Like, the, don't 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 be so humble about it. I mean, I think well, he would is, agree, but he still hates the term creator. That is one yeah, uh, sure, that he sure. rejects definitely. Um, well, he's mm -hmm. even even as like being the greatest, you know, animation director of all time. Uh he's he even even you know Hayao Miyazaki gets the uh crisis of influence. The anxiety of influence, Harold Bloom, yeah, yeah definitely. Anxiety, yeah. As we talked about with Goro Miyazaki as well, who himself felt the anxiety of influence from his father looming over him. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Mm -hmm. It's quite Poetic, even that this is right after Tales from Earthsea, that 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 Miyazaki seemingly exhibits a crisis of influence or anxiety of influence right around the time that he is getting to writing a new movie. Um, just, just a quick yeah, question: the non Earthsea this... movie that features the ocean much more prevalently. Hmm. <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, so just a quick question here: is is this another? I forget. Is this another one where he was retired and came out of retirement? No, I think actually not this oh, okay. time. This is one of the rare ones where he didn't announce his retirement. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, there was another anecdote by Suzuki, where Suzuki basically the, said to Miyazaki at some point, Miyazaki, we need to stop. We're too old. We can't do this. And Miyazaki apparently very uncharacteristically looked shocked at, uh, at Suzuki and said, but what about our social responsibility? And Suzuki was like, Wait, he wants me to tell him to not retire because of this. He did this wouldn't be normally what he would be saying. <laughs> <laughs> the role reversal there. Yeah. It's it's you kind know, of it, beautiful. Oh, <laughs> it is beautiful. You know, he he makes this comment about or uh, Susan Napier in in um in Miyazaki World tells this funny story about like Miyazaki um like joking that that like he and Suzuki should like commit lovers suicide together um <laughs> and you know this this film itself like has a lot to do with like the 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 sort of like gender roles or or centralist you know conceptions of of how lovers should be or what that means in a you know cosmic sense and uh and and then and then you know then you have Miyazaki you know having to subvert his role as the you know the one that is needs encouragement and he has to encourage Suzuki. So yeah. I don't know. I, I, I think it's I, I kind think, of funny um, in a meta way. <laughs> yeah, I think Napier also mentions like that there's this underlying current of um of, of anxiety about uh the role of uh, the masculine figure in Japanese society that that's like uh, mm. underlying the movie. Um which like is pretty relevant to uh, uh to Miyazaki and, and specifically to that yeah. anecdote. Um, yeah, which is really interesting. Oh, just just a side note. I, I I love like continuing like the direction of like the uh, Miyazaki as artist, uh, like like an uh, artistic uh, tsundere who's like, well, it it, it it's not like I I, I I keep myself from retiring because because I like making movies with you. Or anything, yeah, <laughs> idiot. <laughs> I just do it because of the social like, responsibilities. Is okay. Yeah, <laughs> it's such a good dynamic. It's beautiful, but. Yeah, as we were talking about the influence of uh, that Miyazaki draws on, and that he sees himself as flow of human, as within the flow of human civilization, this really is echoed in his own comments on Ponyo as well, where he talks about that the sea is like our subconscious mind, as its waves tossed, as it, as its wave tossed surface intersects with what is above. So, as he writes he writes just without realizing all the influences he's drawing on. And then he says later, he scrapes away at the core of what he's written and he notices this is deeply influenced. This has ties to this, that, this and that. And he feels this is similar to what he expresses using the ocean in this movie, that somehow in the ocean, something is submerged, something true, 
that is under the surface, but that keeps bubbling up and intersecting with the real world. And I think we're going to get into this more when we really dig into the thematic meat of this. But I'll, I would love to keep the idea of the sort of influence as being something unconscious that bubbles up in the creative process in mind as we go through this movie and also the rest of the production, because it has been an idea driving this entire production's artistic direction, as we will be able to explore a little bit when we talk about some people involved in this production. So once Miyazaki kind of formalized the idea that, well, I do want to rewrite The Little Mermaid, which is pretty explicitly what he went in to do. He did his usual uh, 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 thing where he sits down to write the storyboards. And it is always that Miyazaki himself writes the storyboards and he will obsess over it like crazy, doing every piece of the storyboard by himself. But this time he went even further because he had one driving idea. And that is he will do the storyboards in watercolor. Wow. Ooh. Yeah. So Ooh. he actually sat down, locked himself in his room for weeks and as it's as it is described, started churning out watercolor sketches furiously. So you gotta imagine this man has decided I will now be doing art. So I lock myself in my room and I start doing watercolor sketches like crazy. And you can see them in like the documentaries, and it's like pages upon pages upon pages, like really cute, elaborate, beautiful little watercolor sketches making up the entire storyboard. Wow. Yeah, he really was immediately driven that this film is one that is about this kind of color, this kind of colorfulness. And um, another decision made very early on is this should be a film which is entirely hand-drawn. And mm. he, for the time of the production of this movie, the CG department at Studio Ghibli was actually closed. They literally weren't working at all doing the entire movie production, which in 2006 <laughs> to 2008 is remarkable. This is not the time of, you know, hand-drawn animation anymore. This is the time of digital. But he had all his artists draw with watercolor, uh, uh, crayons, pencils, all of that good stuff. And yes, even crayons for some of the backgrounds, which is... Uh, yeah, I noticed that. Yeah, that's yeah. very, very noticeable. Like, like there's a, it result, it's all, all results in this fantastically childlike aesthetic uh, where everything has these, um, the, it, it's all rounded edges and uh, and and uh, and, and sketches it's colored in with and, like rough lines, rough rough like yeah, back and forth of the crayon, you know, and like yeah. mixing up colors. I, uh, I I first noticed like the rocks on the on the bottom of the cliff uh, where, mm. where you know, Sosuke's house is, when he goes down, he first finds Ponyo in the, in the little bottle. But, like, the rocks behind him and on in the face of the cliff, they have every color of the rainbow in them. It's just, like, the way the, the light is refracted off of them. But it's depicted using these very, you know, basic, rudimentary um, materials. That's... It's a really remarkable, like, uh, and like, obstinate dedication to Miyazaki's yeah, yeah. craft. Like, well, yeah, the movie's the really, really fantastic in that. Uh, I think also the way that it has like uh, very l little shadows in the film, like, because we, we've seen, especially in like like Howl's mm. Spirit of the Way, there's good, great use of like heavy shadows. It's like depict a more realistic element, but yeah, there's this real picture book quality. Uh, That's right. And actually, if we're going into the production, uh, the main one of the main people behind this is uh, Nobru Yoshida, who was the art director on Howl's and also Arietti. But those are more in the traditional styles. But interestingly, he was also the art director. And if anyone's seen the shorts called Ghibli's, there were like these little, I think, packed in some of the DVDs, these little OVAs uh, set around the studio done by some of the staff. These weird little kind of almost like weird in-joke movies. Uh, but they have this very mm. s s similar, like, distinct and weird style. Uh, and in fact, I believe he was given, like, a huge uh, influence on the project because uh, I was reading in Danny uh, Calavaro's book about Miyazaki's films. Uh, they say that the director uh, invited his young collaborator to give full vividness and wildness to, of his drawings so as to uh, impart oh, yeah. the, the movie with a distinct vision of his own. So Miyazaki basically gave... Noboru Yoshida, like a, a full reign to like really give the movie its own unique identity and look because it really yeah. does stand out in the catalog. In fact, Noboru Yoshida single-handedly drew every single background art of this movie. 
every single oh, I one. I didn't know that, but yeah. Yeah. Then. Damn. Noboru Yoshida is like a huge part of the making of documentary that I was watching, where um, a short film, as you say, hipster, kind of attracted Miyazaki. Miyazaki saw kind of how Yoshida had drawn the houses and streets and mm. everyday environments in that short, and he said, this is the style that I want. They're like curvy lines, everything is kind of wobbly and warping, not, not super straight, not super realistic, but like colorful, impressive. And when he started working with Yoshida and gave Yoshida full control on this project uh, in terms of being art director and drawing all the background art, he actually had to encourage him again and again. What I want to see here is not you trying to achieve some style, but I want to see your own style. You don't need to have like straight lines on these houses. And in fact, if you look at many of these background uh, uh piece a uh, background art pieces you will see how often nothing is rectangular nothing yeah, is th- very there's straight no lines. sharp no yeah, sharp corners yeah. no, no, nothing nothing you can stub your toe at yes. in this movie like, like w- w- one of the moments I, I i distinctly like recognize this is um there's, there's a shot where um i, I think they've, they've they're in the driveway in the in the little you know a pink car which is also like a, a, a like bubbly round thing uh, as are every vehicle in in the film um like, like but we we also mm. see while they're like like moving around at the car we see the um uh the, the house and the um uh the the front gate you know no the little wooden uh, gate and you look you look at that and you can see that is that will never like animate or move that thing that is clearly like like a a, a drawing from a yeah like from a children's book but what really blows my mind is how everything still works together like you you can still see these characters as like fitting into this uh, this world and the yeah. um the the, the, the Even- backgrounds and the foregrounds and the animating pieces and the characters all somehow like uh coalesce into some like uh, a unified aesthetic which is like I, I believe the sign of a fantastic director. Like this is definitely Miyazaki You're at the so height right. of his his uh, competence. Yeah, I mean, even yeah. he goes even as far as like having an, a bucket, you know, rattling on top of one of these fence posts, and it feels exactly like spatially in its place. It doesn't just look superimposed. And, but even right. even if the the style is is, um, and you could tell it's a different material, right? But uh, than the than the than the cell, but it's yeah, but so not cool. from a different universe or anything, right? Yeah, and, and definitely inside the house, like the entire house uh, oh, yeah. is this crayon aesthetic outside of a couple of things, but it's still mm. like you you don't notice it on just like just by watching, you have to like actively like see like oh uh, this bed here is like just has the regular shading of the people. Yeah, I, I think this, I this think art design of, um, go ahead. is uh yeah the 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 the, the sort of art design um, feel of the whole piece uh, is really nicely like summarized by this direction or or this uh, l- um, point that Miyazaki made under lists of problems when animating the story. He he's, he wrote, "Simple drawings feel warm and liberate the viewer. I want to steer the rudder." towards simplicity and away from overly mature precision. So it's like this, This it's uh, even the art style is supposed to be childlike, you know, and innocent. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. A- a- absolutely. Mm-hmm. And another thing he also mentions is, is a specific thing that I also made made note of, um, which is, is like he wanted the wind to always be there. You, you had to see the... Uh, mm-hmm. the, the wind catching the uh, the grass and uh, and the trees uh, like uh, most of the time like it, it was and it's, yeah. he mentioned it specifically as, as a sort of challenge uh, now, now that they have like more digital tools and and don't use like cells uh, anymore that that gives a lot of like uh, room to, to like make the make the backgrounds move and I think that's part of what makes everything like feel like it fits together uh, in, into a whole because you have these. These surfaces of uh, of like tall grass on a hillside, which are like painted background wise as as, as like a, a very a, a beautiful like e- either crayon or um, uh, or watercolor uh, a, a background, just splashes of color with uh, with a clear outline indicating oh it, it's like these tall tufts of grass sticking up, and then you have these lines moving through them, 
that indicate the the wavy grass in the wind, and all of, and and all of that fits so well together because you also see the wind catching the hair of the characters and catching the trees. Oh yes, I, mm-hmm. I think that like the those sorts of details are what really makes everything fit together. Um, mm. And 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 you you see it also on display uh, in the uh, when everything is submerged. You also see like the, the very deliberately like place various things that are affected in various ways by the you know underwaterness the the the, the, the boats things yeah the the, yeah. The, the the boats that are like floating upwards but still anchored down by by rope <laughs> and and uh, all the fish swimming through various layers um yeah. stuff like that like it, yeah. it, there's and, such and, an attention to like, like not necessarily detail but like just just the right amount of moving parts that like sell mm-hmm. the effect yeah and it always ties in narratively on whether like whether it's a calm scene or whether there's like some something urgent going on 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 like the strong wind and of course the currents uh with the tsunami but the strong wind i, I would say even like in the beginning when uh lisa notices the strong wind it's because like like ponyo has been picked up and like now the narrative is sort of beginning and you know, like chaos ensues. Yeah, absolutely. I, I I think the the thing that I um I feel is like like distinguishes uh Ponyo is that I think it's the most like aesthetically driven film in of of, of Miyazaki's. Like, of course, all yes. all his films are gorgeous in various ways, but I but I feel like it, in Ponyo more than in his other films, the aesthetic is what like carries the movie. Um, Yes. Uh, which which is both like a compliment to like the level of artistry at dis- at display but i also feel like um it is in, in at least in my view like one of the weaker miyazaki films specifically because the the narrative doesn't quite like uh, isn't quite like on par doesn't quite pull the movie uh, along with it but uh, we'll, we'll we'll get to that a bit later I think. yeah we'll we'll probably get to talking discussing the narrative agreeing disagreeing perhaps um, but I want to bring this, tie this back in with the idea that I mentioned to keep in mind, the idea that uh, what he's doing when he's doing art is kind of drawing from the unconscious. Because one of the things that Miyazaki explained as to why and how all these art director choices came about, how he instructed Noboru Yoshida to paint in his own style, how he got the animation director, Katsuya Kondo, who was basically animation director for this entire movie and had like, you know, the second highest ruling and judgment on all animation that was being conducted, how he instructed him to also have his clean lines and this very pleasant and very fluidly animated style. Um, One of the reasons, and also why he decided that no CG would be in this movie, is because he thought that putting the pencil on the paper, just drawing very organically real in a way that recalls the origins of animation, where it was actually just pencil and paper and you start drawing, is for him, and I quote, that... Every time I paint, and whatever I paint, the drawers of my brain start to open little by little. In any case, that's what I want. So he explains that, Mm. and and goes on to explain that whenever he starts drawing storyboards, whenever he starts drawing at all, only as he draws does he slowly get an idea of what the movie is going to be about. He explains, for example, when he starts drawing Fujimoto and has an idea what the character is all about. As he continues to draw him and animate him and give him life, he starts to sympathize and empathize. And suddenly the direction of the movie starts shifting. As he draws and let's say like he opens the drawers in his brain, as he says, this is like tapping into this unconscious that he's evoked so many times in talking about his creative process. This is him tapping into what the drawings mean to him as he is creating them rather than having a very well thought out plan from the start as to what the drawings will be about and where they will go. And the way he wanted to be in touch with this property is by having his own hand on his paper with a pencil and brushes and Mm -hmm. going to it in the most organic way possible. This is one of the leading decisions driving all of the artistic choices in this movie. And yeah. Yeah. I like the way that, um, (coughs) sorry. I like the way that, um, yeah, you say that organic, and it's kind of like literally true for the animation style, the way that uh, everything is, yeah, very, uh, all the character designs, very little lines on them, uh, like bright colors across them, and, and just the way that everything is kind of um, 
Morpheus, particularly Ponyo herself, where she's constantly like switching her proportions between her like fish self and her human self and her weird in between frog weird self. I don't know what the, that middle stage is, but uh, yeah, the con- <laughs> the, yeah, the constant way that she's constantly like, it is like a frog. moving uh, between these stages, uh, it's like really amazing and gives you a sense of uh, yeah, this kind of life that animation is supposed to be like this imitation of life. And uh, uh, gets to it in a way that uh, I feel his other movies, Miyazaki is a very technical animator. Like we see he loves to draw like planes and machinery and stuff. But this is like the complete opposite end. Like everything and even the cars in this movie are animated like they're living beings. Like that are just sliding mm-hmm. about and their proportions are constantly Underwater. shifting. Yeah. The yeah. boats especially. There was a part where Miyazaki talked about how in traditional animation you have to put, if you draw a boat, for example, you would usually draw one painting of the boat and then slide it across the frame, which would lock you into perspective. And I don't have the quote perfectly here right now, but he said something like the uh, uh, um, curse of perspective drawing. Oh, I have found the quote, the quote now. That he said to get rid of straight lines and to use gently warped lines that allow the possibility of magic to exist and to liberate us from the curse of perspective drawing. So like his instructions revolved around I do not want you to just paint one boat and have it like slide across the water. I want you to draw it frame by frame, have it be organic, free us from the curse of perspective drawing, which is really cool as to how he like even mm-hmm. conceives on a meta level, like what is animation to him here, which led in this movie to an insane amount of frames for each device that would often, you know, there are some boats that are drawn as like a single frame and slid across the water, but not when it's important. Like in the important scenes, you always see the boat like animated like free from perspective in beautiful you know 12 paintings per frame or whatever i i don't know exact, exactly yeah. the rate of animation here but it's extremely high and leads to ex- an extreme amount of keyframes for a lot of these animations which of course indicates a high technical prowess with a with an intent behind it and yeah, this along with the mix of um like like you said earlier that, that he's just able to switch the plot on a whim because he's very um, sporadic, uh, let's say, uh, is pretty much like the strength of Miyazaki. Which, by the way, gives his team quite a bit of anxiety because as the movie is already <laughs> half finished, Miyazaki is still busy drawing the storyboard for Ponyo. <laughs> There's an interview where he, the voice actress for Ponyo and the band who did the uh, ED song, the Ponyo, Ponyo, you know, um, he's at an Yay. interview with them and a, and a little bit of a public audience. And Miyazaki explains, well, I wanted this song to be upbeat and happy because I know I want it to be a happy ending, but I don't know yet. It's not finished. Everyone's just kind of looking at him awkwardly <laughs> like, uh... <laughs> Please. Everyone starts sweating. Uh, but yeah, the, this movie is, is insanely animated in like every way. Like we said, yeah, it's, it's about life and it's about this stuff. And it, it really almost, um, when I first watched this film, it really felt almost like it was a show-off. Like Miyazaki mm. at like almost the peak of his career after releasing like two of the most successful films in Japanese history, kind of just wanted to sh- like show that he at his old age could still just like animate the shit out of a film. Oh so, yeah, like everything is moving, everything is constantly squishing and mm-hmm. stretching and like looking weird in in the best ways. So yeah. one of the main this things, is amazing, um, amazing balance between like freedom and and free free form movement. And also like a holistic aesthetic that doesn't break, uh, no matter how like wild the animation gets. So Suzuki like, it, kind it's, of it's, it's just it's just the biggest flex. Like holy yeah. crap! Suzuki details uh, if we go kind into of subconscious, the... if we go into subconscious sim- um, symbolism, I'm wondering how much Miyazaki sees himself as a uh, Fujimoto, because uh, just to me at least, the opening scene of Fujimoto like standing there and having little drops by his own hand into the water that creates all this little life, all these jellyfishes in the amazing opening scene. I'm almost imagining like Miyazaki, he always wants to put like the pen to paper or like the watercolors and slowly kind of creates this effect of life in his own way. That's so kind of the uh, neurotic parallels. old man does, does really fit Miyazaki's But also the well. kind of father that sort of escapes into this weird mm. creation instead of, you know, spending yeah, a lot of time uh, with big, his family. Ignoring his children a lot. Yeah, I'm wondering if there is a parallel there. I feel that he, he even writes himself is, that yeah. Fujimoto is an intellectual who runs away. He's like one of these examples of like uh, uh, um, the mo- modern failed masculinity. 
Yeah, doesn't he also as, specifically? As conceives of it. I think he specifically at one point compares him to uh, one of his co-workers, right? Um, oh, I mean, he, maybe, maybe, yeah. he does in one yeah. way. His animation director Katsura Kondo had at the time a one-year-old child, yeah. And the fact that Kondo was like spending all his time working on the movie instead made Miyazaki unfavorably mm. compare Kondo to Fujimoto, yes, but like not in the. <laughs> direct oh, sense. Not, yeah, okay. It's but just like, in a joking, yeah. joking sense. Okay. Yeah, but also like mm, in the sense of Yeah, uh, Projecting hard. Susan Napier definitely agrees that Fujimoto has some aspects of Miyazaki to him. But because, I mean, Fujimoto is kind of like an alternative version of Howl, I think. Because, well, Howl wasn't a father really, but, you know, isolated in that realm far from humanity, claiming that he isn't human anymore, existing sort of yep. outside of what they are all about in his jaded own, like, cynical capacity. There's a huge similarity between the two, and they're both wizards or sorcerers, you know, whatever, how we, how we should put it. Yeah. Creatives. Yeah. Even though he doesn't like being called a creative, but... Yeah. <laughs> and it's one of Miyazaki's oldest messages that he even, like, uh, back in Laputa days expressed, like, you cannot live separate from the ground. You cannot live away from people. And whenever he has characters that are like Fujimoto or, like, um, Howl, they are always, like, sort of meditations on the degree to which he himself uh, has, as he details his own autobiographical experiences, the degree to which he himself has gotten or lost touch with, with some people, with his family, with his own son, with mm -hmm. environments, when he gets lost in work. Yeah. So, um, God, there was something I wanted to say before we went into the parallels between Fujimoto and Miyazaki. Can you quickly refresh me on what we were saying before? Um, you were ta we were talking about the subconscious, like... Oh, even um, before that, but I have it now, thank you. Um, Suzuki uh, detailed the process as because Hipster talked about Miyazaki trying to show off, in quotation marks, in, in this movie. This is actually really true, but it, it has a much more interesting process that uh, Suzuki talked about in an interview where he says that Miyazaki, first of all, always tries to make sure to try and give the job to someone else. He always says, okay, you try to do this scene to someone of his co-workers and, and lets them animate it because he does, does, doesn't definitely doesn't want to be like a main key animator as much as he can in the sense that he thinks he's very old and of course it's like physically taxing so Miyazaki tries to give it to others but Suzuki explains how Miyazaki is always kind of happy and glad if he finds a scene that he knows only he himself can animate when he tries to give it to other people and finds glee in the fact that he says no I have to do this shot myself I'm the only one who can do it so Miyazaki ended up animating all the waves in this movie by himself completely all of them Wow! Yeah. What, what a Miyazaki diva. also notorious for just re like animating large portions of his films because he's not satisfied with them so yeah, it's, yeah he's a perfectionist yeah yeah perfectionist is the right word but yeah the waves turned out tremendously uh, well so um there is some joy when Miyazaki reports that yes in this regard I know I'm still one of the best and you yeah. know there's well earned pride in his work because the waves are indeed one of the attention stealing or sh uh, 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 show stealing features of this movie when they are on screen present they really do take over your attention mm -hmm. yeah and going back to the idea of the sub of the sea and these waves like representing this bubbling subconscious and how that um sort of like is injected into the entire film with you know um uh, Ponyo's like subconscious like affecting her own you know, uh, physical form um, in in the creative process and in in getting um, the composer Joe Hisaishi up to speed on like what are the ideas of this film, like what you know he wanted Hisaishi to think about while composing the score. Um, he 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 basically just like rambled for uh, for like six or seven paragraphs and then at the end he said well with this in mind the music required for this film must be different from past scores this is the reason my thoughts are a jumble and i'm stumped of course we also need background music i hope to discuss with you the overall conceptualization for this project basically you know he he, he basically is just letting his subconscious like uh ideas just just bubble up and you know almost in a way like his you know uh as you were saying before in the yard, when, when he's like drawing and it's opening the drawers in his mind, um, you know, 
He's trying to give that to Hisaiji. And I think Hisaiji's yeah. score, like, really, really does this really well. There's, like, a lot of motivic development in the in the score. Um, it's very really interesting these, that after yeah. one meeting with Miyazaki, where Hisaiji and Miyazaki talked about the, the soundtrack composition, Hisaiji already walked home, kind of, or, or like, le Miyazaki left. I don't know where they actually met, uh, but, like, Immediately after the meeting, he says he started humming a melody to himself, the, like, ha, 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 ha. you know, the 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 ponyo <laughs> ponyo <laughs> melody. And he was kind of thinking, yeah. is this gonna be the melody? I think it's too simplistic. I can't read. No. And he just kind of mulls over the idea until at some point he presents it to Miyazaki. Miyazaki's like, that's it. You got it. This is the one. Mm -hmm. Like the immediate connection was there. Miyazaki just explains it to him and immediately he says she comes up with this cute like simple melody that was like being the leading motif in a lot of the soundtrack and of course the ed song um yeah well it's really telling like at this point in both of their careers and they're still working together like these are two really uh um like well honed like artists or the, who've honed their crafts you know um that that also just they get each other they get each other's vision you know, it's it's. I love the collaboration of Hisaishi and Miyazaki so much. Yeah, there was a bit in that documentary where Hisaishi was like, "Well, it's it's kind of scary every time like the 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 next Miyazaki film comes around because you know he's only making a film every four years, and by then you will have to show everything you've you've stored up in those four years in terms of artistic capacity." <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's just me who thinks this, but um. Maybe because I, I think it the most uh, Miyazaki films most aimed at children, but the Ponyo theme very much reminded me of the Totoro theme as well. Mm -hmm. Like the, yeah, the simplicity, yeah. the uh, the kind of hey, the melody of just go. singing the name of the the film, and this. Uh, I think they both had the child actors like the that did the main characters sing along. Yeah, oh absolutely. yes, and 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 they and That's they both like do the they they also both do the like thing where like they, it's they sort of like fake conflict a little bit but everything's fine you know mm -hmm. like the, the kids wake up and everything's flooded to hell and it's <laughs> like an, an apocalyptic scenario you know it should be horrifying it should be like oh god we're like should are we the scary. last ones left but instead it's just a fun little adventure it's just nice it's just ah, let's just take a let's take a trip in a in, yeah. in this little toy boat we made real you know no, it should That's take the away magic of their untainted perspective that should take away from the fact that some dark and shitty things are actually happening. We see it a lot in yeah, the adult that, characters. Yeah, there still is a plot. But, yeah. Yeah. There still is oh, a plot in there. there yeah, are dark things yeah are just like Totoro, like Miyazaki loves to make a film that children can watch and really just engage with on such the, the, the visceral funness of it. But he actually layers a lot of little, like, more adult themes about his anxieties of the world that you can really, like, pick up on watching watching over. I think, uh, yeah. yeah, like the, we have the, the sick mother that's never quite resolved in Totoro, and that's always like this lingering tension. And of course, in uh, Ponyo, mm -hmm. we kind of have this adult perspective of like, uh, what, what what could go wrong? Like, is this going to last? You know, this kind of... Uh, and yeah, also and the estrangement kind of, having, of parental figures, Having the figures, old people right? in the film uh, represent this kind of, um, like the beginning of life and end of life in the in the same kind of space to, to yeah. weigh on the audience's mind. And I think that contrast was really important to um, Miyazaki to the extent that he insisted that the the voice actors for Ponyo and Sosuke l literally be five year olds. And he said, "He said it may be hard, but you got to do it." <laughs> and they did do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, and it's the amazing. I mean, they, 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 they did kind of make they did kind of make Sosuke like like a a, pro a child prodigy. Like he, he's very. Uh, uh, he, he's like mature for his age. Yeah, that's uh, true. I, I think that's very much the point when, when uh, like Miyazaki very much worded as if he was a prodigy, like intentionally. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. yeah like they, they they make it clear like like uh, it's not not just uh, his dad is like, oh man, my my kid's a genius. He 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 can he can like do. Uh, I don't think it's Morse exactly. It's like the Japanese version of Morse code, uh, and he uh, and and he he t and he's like. But but also like the kid, the kid's very like empathetic and understanding. Mm -hmm. Like he's just an amazing kid. Like yeah, he has if a lot of kids was that easy, Everyone would be a parent. You know? Yeah, and I think there was. Um, I think Susan Napier references that in an interview Miyazaki said that he was of course heavily inspired by the children at the the Ghibli daycare. Oh yeah, uh, I think we've referenced this before. But Miyazaki, because he saw so many female staff, 
joining the company, insisted a daycare be built adjacent to the Ghibli offices. And that's almost reflected uh, in this movie by you have uh, Miyazaki being like the old people's home next door to the uh, the preschool. Mm-hmm. And he loves this. Uh, he loves, he, he says, I, th- I think he also said in the interview that he really likes the the fact that children can kind of be around older people and kind of give them a, a kind of hope and like life. Yeah. And Miyazaki said he was very influenced by just seeing the children play. Because uh, I think this movie out of like, because there's many children characters in a lot of uh, like Miyazaki films and like anime in general. But this one, the way the children are animated feels so like realistic. The way they kind of have like, you know, like stubby legs and the way they run around weird almost. Like they're just still growing into their bodies. They have this uh, property that's such an attention to detail that they probably studied them for animation for quite a while. Yeah. And one of the things is he expressed that you know, it doesn't just give old people hope, but very specifically himself. He Mm. himself, when he's cynic and he's asking himself the questions, how can you even live in this world? And like, what is it even all for? And, you know, the world is fucked up. And of course, we know Miyazaki is like a very politically conscious, uh, angry dude that that, that, that yells at clouds, you know, everything. He yells at people and uh, politics and everything. But when he looks at children, he says, then he sees hope. Like he recognizes Mm -hmm. that these children will grow up in a, in a pretty bad world, which is how he sees it. Um, but he wants them to be able to appreciate and be happy in this world and find ways to appreciate the experiences they can get in this world. When he looks at children, he sees people that can do this still, that are living day by day into the day and enjoying what they see and excited about every experience. And this is why he said in 2008 that the film celebrates the birth of these children who feel regret for being born into this world, which is one of the leading ideas that drives him to Ponyo as well. And by the way, Mm. interesting enough, like this whole concept is also embodied because of course, Hipster, as you said, like, we reflect a lot about how sh- uh, how the world has problems, like the chaos, the absent fathers all over the work, and like the mother has anger and frustration that she cannot really rent. But in the instructions for how to present the setting, he wrote pretty clearly, idealize present-day Japan to make it seem a bit more livable. That <laughs> is like a quote in Turning Point as to how he wants the settings to be designed. That's also such a... Uh, I guess poignant idea. Like he wants yeah, to take which, the which also, present which day and appreciate gets, it. Yeah, which also gets back to like the the, the whole like aesthetic, like the holistic aesthetic of the, of the whole thing. Yeah. Like all these all these rounded <laughs> edges, all all these uh, uh, like e- even the most industrial machinery in, in the world seem like you, you you could like pick them up and like put them into like a like a, a, a sandbox for kids to play with. Um, it, it's that kind of. Um, it, it, it's not necessarily like through storytelling and writing that he establishes that. Oh, this is a pleasant place. No, it's it's all in the uh, in, in in the way that uh, everything looks and sounds and moves. Definitely, there's there's a there's a paper uh, called a Goldfish Out of Water: Miyazaki's Little Mermaid by Deborah Ross, where she kind of makes a comparison between Disney's Little Mermaid and Miyazaki's Ponyo, in that in Disney's Little Mermaid somehow. The underwater world is rich and vibrant and everyone's singing and dancing. And on top, it is kind of like scary and mundane. It's just like, you know, the prince and the nice house and there's a cook who slices up fish. And the, he's, she sort of points out that there's a sort of disconnect in the aesthetic presentation of underwater versus the topside world. Because while the narrative presents the world above as desirable and the goal of our protagonist, somehow the animation does exactly the opposite. Underwater is beautiful and imaginative and up there where you actually want to go to have a nice house with your prince is boring and mundane. Yeah. While Miyazaki here manages to not only have an extremely rich, vibrant and fascinating underwater world, but somehow manages to make the mundane even as fascinating as the rich underwater world where both mm-hmm. sides are beautiful and drawing you to them. Yeah, yeah like we get the just, amazing just, uh, scene where Ponyo first meets Sosuke as, uh, in her girl form. And they just go around the house, like, doing mundane things, like cooking and, like, turning on the lights. But Ponyo is, like, so uh, enraptured by this human life. And it, like, because the whole movie is, like, displayed through her and Sosuke's eyes. We kind of, yeah. like, yeah, the, that child, child, childlike wonder at just, like, the most mundane things. Being yeah, possible. That, that, that's, like, my second favorite scene in the whole movie is, is, is exactly that, where they, 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 they just go in, uh, in, inside the house during, during the storm and just like 
they, they, they just, it's just a scene where we figure out like, okay, is the water on? Let's uh, l- let's see if the water's on, and it's on, yay! Mm. And and let's go out to check check out the generator, make sure everything works, uh, and then the power's on, and uh, and, and like uh, the mother uh, Lisa, uh, she she's just just amazing parenting in that scene, like just just a really uh, like re- really good at uh, at like keeping the the kids calm and engaged with everything and like mm. treating them well, uh, especially Ponyo, who's like. At that point, uh, a guest who, like, it, that's another thing. Like, it's very vague in the movie, like, exactly how much the a- adults understand how magical Ponyo is, like, from the start. <laughs> yeah. Like, she, she seems to just be like, um, like, it's pretty apparent that she's magical. And this literally is the fish from earlier. Yeah. But she just takes it in stride, probably because there's, like, bigger things to worry about, like, like the storm. <laughs> Yeah, I, lo- I love the way the movie depicts uh, Lisa. Yeah, she's a, she's a great character, and again, in that childlike perspective, I really like the. She's almost like the vision a child has of their mother, where she's like just super confident. She's like never worried about anything. She's always uh, like doing the right thing. Uh, that of course, uh, amazing initial D sequence where she's just like steering the car like crazy <laughs> around stuff. <laughs> And like avoiding the waves. She's just completely fine at doing the most crazy shit while driving. And also... Because that's like how Sosuke sees her. Like this is how he sees her as just this amazing woman. And she's also amazing doing these little mundane things like making ramen, which is still like a wonder and awe-inspiring to, you know, to Ponyo. And also to emphasize that childlike perspective, you know, Ponyo she's new to this world she's new to this world this this world is like even though it's mundane for you know for surface people you know she is seeing everything with fresh eyes and she she's learning and absorbing and she sees the you know lisa set up the the radio antenna and then she you know uh learns about like how a, a new application for her magic and she's like got a little antenna hair like you know, sending out a barrier so that Fujimoto can't get in, even while she's taking a nap. I think that's just so cool. Like, it, it shows yeah. that she was paying attention to what Lisa was doing. Yeah, but but I definitely want to focus a little bit on on Lisa because I found it really noteworthy how how troubled she is at what she's doing. How she is not a perfect mother. Like we talked about all the things she does right, but mm-hmm. we shouldn't forget that there's like scenes of her being like. Koichi, the father, says, "No, I'm, 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 I can't come home today." And she has a little anger fit, is disappointed, is sad, starts drinking, doesn't make lunch, sleeps like on the floor mm-hmm. as as as, as Sosuke tries to shear her up and succeeds in shearing her up, which which is noteworthy. But also that she is worried at times, like for instance, when um, she has made sure that Ponyo and Sosuke are comfortable at home, she says, well, I have to leave. I have to look after the old people in the retirement home. Like here are responsibilities, which I think shows another interesting aspect of her parenting as a contrast to, let's say, Fujimoto's parenting. Because her parenting mm. is she and Sosuke, well, Sosuke calls her Lisa, first of all, not Okasan or, mm-hmm. you know, mom or anything like that but by her first name. And in a sense, um, Lisa treats him as an equal in some ways. Because when it comes to, well, I need to look after the people in the old folks' home, she says, please, you know, take care of Ponyo. I know you're going to be fine here. Like, she trusts that he will be fine, even though he's only five years old. He may be a prodigy child, but there's a high degree of freedom that Sosuke experiences. Yeah. He gets to play in very dangerous places, like at the water. And like, you know, there's a scene where Lisa clamps in the water to rescue Sosuke, basically, when he when he first loses Ponyo. But um, there is a high degree of freedom in what Sosuke's parenting consists of. Whereas Fujimoto, I mean, there's literally a scene where Fujimoto grabs Ponyo, says, you can't evolve yet, and forces Ponyo in this bubble to regress back to a previous stage of evolution and locks her up. I, I, I wonder if that like, has some metaphorical significance. Probably not. <laughs> hmm. A great I mean, scene. The I mean, squishing of Ponyo's face is, is amazing. I love, I love that. I mean, it's literally like... Her head yeah. Down. <laughs> Outside of that, I would say that Ponyo and uh, Sosuke are essentially like like the red only and the blue only. They're very very similar. Outside of like you know the the background of one being forced into seclusion 
and the other like essentially having a very free life. Yeah, um, like they get along with each other pretty much instantly and stuff. I guess. Well, I, guess yeah, I think it all comes down to uh, we see we've seen this frequently in a lot of Miyazaki's uh, work that the idea that like children are much more mature and capable than like adults give them credit for. So he kind of wants to always create this idealized kind of thing where like the mum does leave Sosuke and Ponyo by themselves because she knows they can kind of take care of themselves. And where we see that they do in in, in the film. Uh, so he kind of wants to create this vision of parenting in which Lisa is always there for Sosuke when she when he needs her. But then she, of course, like knows the level of like freedom to give him to trust him. Well, of course, uh, Fujimoto doesn't and is just a. Uh, just wants his children to just do exactly what he says and like then ignores them the rest of the time which yeah, kind I, of leads I, I, I us kind of, yeah I, I kind of di- like di- di- dis- disagree ex- exactly for that reason like with the idea that like oh her leaving them there to go to the old folks home is like uh another part of her being like not a perfect mother i i, I think like like it, it's it's a it's a sweet moment where she she trusts sosuke and also where she explains why is she explains that like you're safe here, but I but I have to like, but it's not not just my job. Like we're friends with these you know old folks. I I, I have to go over there and see if they're okay. And Sosuke mm-hmm. understands that. Like, um, a, 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 another thing that like I, I I make note of is like a lot of the characters in the movie are like, caretakers of uh, of some sort. Uh, like so- Sosuke's mom is not just his mom. She's also like, uh, works at a nursing home. Uh, Sosuke becomes a caretaker of, of Ponyo when she's when she's a fish, and he's like uh, really nice about it. Like like he's 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 kind of a natural uh, like uh, that that sort of thing. Um, and uh, and you have of course uh, the uh, you have Ponyo's father, who's like not not a very good caretaker, but like it's still his role. Um, and and of course a uh, uh, grandmama, uh, the goddess of the sea, who's like a caretaker of all life. In, in in the seas, even Ponyo uh, is like a caretaker to her little care, sisters. Like, caretaking is just like like such a such a theme throughout it. Mm. This kind of leads us also into the you know kind of interesting and weird um, presence of gender in this film, which goes way back to when Miyazaki first writes his document, his notes to Johi Saishi, where he explains in, in, in very clear terms, and I know I've gotten a comment on a previous video where uh, 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 someone complained that we're over-interpreting into the politics of this, and I don't need, we need, don't need to draw identity politics into the... Listen, Miyazaki wrote <laughs> notes on music to Johi Saishi and said, the sea is the feminine principle, land is the masculine principle, and Ponyo is the pure feminine principle. And that Sosuke at the end of the movie strikes a new balance where gender is left unstable and neither side wins ultimately. So this is very warranted to talk about these things. And this is how we should get into this. Because Miyazaki argues strongly and in tons of interviews surrounding this film that what we are seeing is sort of a failure or an end to traditional masculinity in terms of, you know, he talks about the workers, uh, one of which is Koichi, on the boat, which he says aren't really respected by society anymore. And that really what Koichi represents as he is on this this boat is one of the fathers who runs away from being a parent, um, who whose paternal order, uh, it, it, as it's called at some point, is uh, sort of unstable, just as Fujimoto. But Fujimoto clings to it he's controlling he tries to over determine what his children may do or may not do he has this very suffocating style of parenting literally uh, almost like if we see like him just crushing ponyo's bubble to bring her back to a previous sort of evolutionary stage and i feel like we're gonna have gender come up quite a bit more as we continue in our analysis of the themes but like this contrast of Ponyo, this chaotic, uncontrollable energy and the creation of life underwater and like the richness of pre-Cambrian, you know, underwater creatures or Cambrian underwater creatures as Fujimoto's Alexia explodes into the ocean. Like this crucible of creation versus the land, which Miyazaki sort of calls like the order and the order of the world, the domain of the men and the structure of men and how sort of the structure uh, uh, breaks apart in this movie and how this movie deals with this structure breaking apart with the impossibility of the sort of men of 
you know, previous ages of narrative or fiction. And that's uh, that he says that at some point he says, you cannot have a male hero anymore, except if he's a little boy. And he sort of refers to this stage before you become a man, before you become, you know, codified into the role and the position you're supposed to inhabit in society as a man. Again, the idea of kids being sort of unclouded by what society yields for them. So the the relationship mm -hmm. between like, what is a mother's parenting, which by the way, is very similar between Lisa and Grandma Mara, which is a lot of freedom and liberation for the children, because again, women in this movie are associated with creativity, with nurturing, with creation, you know, with the sea. Um, yeah. Where Grandma Mara, like the first moment that Grandma Mara hears of Ponyo's new name, which, you know, she's you, she is called Brunhilde by her father, and he insists on calling her Brunhilde. Um, well, just dead naming her straight up, what a terrible parent. Yeah. But when Grandma Mara has, first has, <laughs> hears Ponyo, she says, wow, Ponyo, what a beautiful name. She is just completely unconcerned and she's just you know happy and encouraging and liberating towards mm -hmm. her child which she basically mm -hmm. isn't really doing much for i mean you know we should see grandma mara as kind of omnipresent in the film because she like embodies like all of the ocean and like the entire feminine and creating principle as in this movie's language mm -hmm. but uh she also like is hands off very hands off and that is yeah. um a driving yeah, I, idea I that's, here. that's the most interesting contrast because yeah uh, Basically, both uh, main characters get like one parent that's uh, they're always around with Ponyo and Fujimoto and uh, Sosuke and Lisa. But yeah, um, Ponyo's mother is like again almost absent, like Sosuke's father. Like she, yeah, she's meant to be kind of around in the way that Sosuke's father passes by on the boat now and then. But like she, she clearly just learned about Ponyo's whole like transformation and stuff like after it's all happened, you know. And Ponyo's already put large portions of humanity at risk with her actions, you know. <laughs> so I, th I think the movie, in a way, kind of bet portrays both sides as, like, not quite uh, being complete without each other. Because, yeah, Grandma Mare, um isn't maybe paying as much attention as she should be. She's giving Ponyo a little too much freedom uh, while Fujimoto is trying to control her too much. Right. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. a yeah. quick, I quick get... side note here. Um, <clears throat> like, the... Um, the, the, uh, the, the, there's this element where, like, uh, we've already like discussed how the female element is associated with the ocean and creativity and nurturing mm -hmm. in life. Um, at the same time, like, the masculine element ha has this sort of decision-making power uh, with, like, naming as one, one of the things. Uh, and, 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 like, P Ponyo's, like, conflict is... Uh, is it, it is internal, but it, it is expressed through her choice between her father and Sosuke, like the, the two male figures who like uh, who represent different directions she could, she could take in life, and, and the mm -hmm. ultimate uh, like the decisions that uh, that like lead to, uh, to to the climax of the film are like mostly Sosuke's. Uh, like he, he's he's the one who leads Ponyo to the point where she can. Uh, make that uh, that decision I, I just think that's well, an interesting like that the male characters are like, sort of the movers we need yeah, to see okay, 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 hold pre, on. pre male though that's very important he's yes, not yet very there. important and and okay so if if this film is miyazaki's deconstruction and 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 like basically uh putting the nail in the coffin for traditional masculinity then that necessitates whether miyazaki knows that he's doing it or not though i suspect he does is that it also means an end to traditional feminine roles or femininity that has been prescribed to women and girls by a, you know, patriarchal society and these uh, patriarchal, you know, archetypes of, of literature. And what th the choice between Fujimoto and Sosuke is the choice between uh, um, like fitting into the mold of the feminine gender role as as you know being possessed by the men and and controlled and only allowed to behave a certain way versus being completely free and open and human right and inc inc incorporating all these different ranges of expression 
that Ponyo does and that Sosuke accepts all of and doesn't limit Ponyo. Yeah. And in a way, Lisa is also a, a woman that is, she's, she's got so much energy, so she's got so much life. And uh, Koichi is afraid of her because she isn't the traditional, you know, feminine, demure wife. Mm. Which is why he goes to the sea because the sea is is this representation of a an ideal of femininity of ages past, right? And Lisa though is is liberated from this, so so that's why he goes to the sea. But it, but like Miyazaki is saying, it's like the the these these men who are chasing after the, like the romanticism of like the age of of um, of navigation and things like that. They they're living in the past. They're chasing after this, this ideal that is, that can't pave a way to the future, and so the relationship between Sosuke and and Ponyo is this prop like Miyazaki's proposal of like, hey, we got to look at the children, those children who have not yet become or or been tainted and and influenced and molded into these societally prescribed roles. But they are able to have a relationship of love and support and acceptance that is is free of that baggage. There's an interesting scene, just to g- give more credence to exactly your point. Um, there's an interesting scene in that making off documentary where Miyazaki is sitting in the vocal recording booth with uh, the voice actors. And he's instructing them. And Koichi's voice actor, Kazushige Nagashima he tells him to redo a line over and over again and he keeps giving instructions. He keeps saying, you need to sound more confident. I want you to sound like a samurai from a historical drama. I want you to embody this sense, this 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 kind of man that doesn't exist anymore. And he starts rambling about how modern men, like the voice actor he's talking to, like breathe <laughs> like, like this and they sound like this and they're exasperated, but like a samurai would talk like this. And he like really demands of that voice actor to really embody these ideas of old masculinity. Miyazaki just hating on these new males. He just can't. <laughs> <laughs> he just can't. Yeah, um, so but, uh, Miyazaki's my, my a little reading bit... of the, the gender thing is maybe a little bit different. Um, okay. Just from uh, you, your perspective, you were saying, Voice, that um, these kids haven't quite embodied these roles yet, but I feel like there's a huge part of the film in which is maybe at least the kids performing these roles and like being very much saddled with the gender expectations and the parental kind of uh, mm-hmm. view of the world. Because uh, we see well, once uh, Lisa leaves and Ponyo and Sosuke have to go out on their own, we immediately get this like long segment that, um, funnily enough, I think I think Susan Napier, who compared it to the African Queen, oddly enough, uh, the Humphrey Bogart movie, uh, it's kind of familiar in that way in which they both go on this long trek down on their own boat and they do form this kind of like husband and wife couple. Like Koichi puts on mm. his little sailor's hat and goggles because he's trying to be like his dad. He's clearly very much... Uh, like trying to obtain that masculine role that he views his father as, and of course we get the interaction with the uh, the the baby that uh, Ponyo has, where she kind of like um, uh, she gives for the opai, as we already referenced. Uh, <laughs> yes. She wants the baby to grow to grow healthy, uh, and like it does this these motherly things for it, and is clearly enthralled by a baby. So uh, I, th- I think the, yeah. the film definitely does a lot where it's like these children are going to inevitably be influenced by the world around them. Definitely. And that's uh, the kind of like, I guess, though, yeah, the, in the end, the movie's kind of like these kids uh, have these traditional expectations upon them, but then they still kind of choose to continue to live. Because I think one of the most critical things in the film is that uh, Sosuke is, is forced to make a choice. So it's like, will you love Ponyo forever? Will you accept her? And uh, you, the... I think it's kind of positioned where, like, the audience would think, well, how can a five-year-old really make that decision? How can he know? But it's like, we know that Sosuke's lived for pretty much all of his life so far, where his parents are constantly apart from each other. Like, he knows what a bad relationship looks like, where, like, the mum is always frustrated that the father can never be home. Like, and Ponyo, likewise, has seen her parents be constantly estranged, and they're, like, they rarely meet, and, like, there's no this kind of... They, 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 they're aware of the problems that like an adult relationship must have and like they still accept it in the end. The, the, the key 
the key question or the key term here is hybridity or hybrid mm, identities. Yeah, yeah. Because we have Ponyo as a, you know, mermaid or at least transforming fish girl. Um, we, it, we, as we've learned, the land is the domain of the, the masculine, the sea is the domain of the feminine in Miyazaki's words. So what does it mean for a creature like Ponyo to transform from one into the other? Let's study really closely what happens. Ponyo decides the surface is interesting, gets an interest in that the surface is interesting. And she, despite the parental authority of her, you know, male father, um, breaks out, decides, no, I am gonna, you know, become a hybrid of land and sea, meaning masculine and feminine. I'm gonna transform, I'm gonna exp impose my agency, I'm gonna decide to do this. And she does decide to leave the water, get, get legs and experience of the world on the land. So this already puts her into a transforming, into a hybrid position, not just because this is sort of coming of age to some degree. It is more coming of age for, for Sosuke than for Ponyo, to be honest. Um, for Ponyo, we have the merging of her, of the unimpeded creative energy and wildness of the feminine being structured by legs, by arms, by experiences with, with Soska into a hybrid construction. But not that Soska takes away from her the wildness or anything, but instead that Soska and Ponyo together like experience the joys of existing in this in this hybrid space, right? Soska himself has a strong affinity to the water. He's a child. His imagination is not soiled. Uh, he's not, has not gotten lost. He has not been structured completely into the realm of the masculine. You know what I mean? What happens here, and this is really interesting as a, I guess, from a feminist philosophical standpoint, right? A ton of feminist critics have sort of argued that the masculine is seen as the primary and the feminine as the secondary, derived from masculine, like literally the Bible, right? Adam's rib was turned into Eve. In this movie, mm. we have the opposite. The ocean, the primordial crucible of life, is the feminine. And what is structured out of it, the attempt to bring order into the creative liberty and freedom, the restrictive is the masculine. The masculine is something derived from the feminine imposed on it. And we have this negotiation between these two concepts very vividly on display in this movie, as, you know, Miyazaki insists that um, what is important about being a child and the creativity of childhood that he associates strongly with the ocean and femininity is that you, even though you grow up and live on the land, you retain some of that in yourself. You don't forget it. And that is what we experience with Ponyo, I think. Out of her agency, she breaks out from the traditional feminine. She resists parental fatherly uh, rules and becomes a hybrid indicating a sort of new way. As Miyazaki says in, in Turning Point, neither the masculine nor the fem feminine wins. What instead remains is Sosuke and Ponyo, who as children exist in such a hybrid space that gender and these traditional roles and these balance, the, the balance between those two worlds is destabilized. And this is ultimately, um, I think, what the gender relations in this movie are telling us, right? Yeah, I think a good example of this is with uh, Fujimoto, actually, because what you said about the hybridity, I think a really nice detail to pay attention to is the fact that Fujimoto, he is kind of, maybe they could play more into the environmental themes that we talk about, but he, in a sense, he's rejected his humanity. He's decided to completely live as this weird uh, sea wizard, and he doesn't even refer to himself as humans. Like, he says humans like that other thing, and he hates them. And he's like, yeah, you know, I, I, I he's had children a with a... Yeah. Yeah, he used to be a human. He's like had children with the sea goddess. But as, as we actually noticed, he still needs to breathe air. I think it's a real interesting detail. Like he's underwater, but he always has like bubbles around him or he has like air pockets in his house. Yeah. So he's not actually changed in any way. He's still just a human who just like lives in the ocean and has made himself think that he's not human anymore. So he's Wait. still holding on to all this baggage and all these things. And that's kind of like a key point of his anxiety. Because like we see with Wait. Ponyo, Ponyo completely becomes a human girl. She goes from one world to another 100%, while Fujimoto is is truly like bound by his origin and he can never like shake that no matter how much he lives in the ocean. Wait, so so when he has this little watering can that he sprays on the ground so he can walk on it, is that is that just a delusion? Like, yeah, he's, 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 he's a complete serve. larva, yeah. He's, he just wants to think he's a <laughs> thing, yeah. I, 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 I just, just uh, that's a great just hang, hang on. While we're on uh, Fujimoto, I just just a side note. I really wanted to mention that 
like Fujimoto must have been a hell of a like like hell of a chad back in the day to to like to get Grandma Mare. I mean, have you looked at her? <laughs> Grandma I mean, Mara has many husbands, is what Miyazaki says. She has many, many husbands. Okay, well, so, that makes okay sense. But, yeah. but she's also a very, very free spirit. She yeah, definitely yeah, is. Exactly. I mean, she, so I think what Grandma Mara really represents and how Fujimoto kind of taps into her is the interesting dynamic we've touched on earlier. Is Fujimoto is like an aspect of Miyazaki, the creator, the someone who is like his work, his creation draws him away from humanity, literally to the point where Fujimoto says, well, we got to wipe out humanity. We got to get rid of them. We got to use, use the good juice and we bring about the, you know, ancient fish again. That is what we need to do. And what this gives him, he is in an interesting position where while he despises the world, he kind of gets rid of the world. He doesn't want to see himself as a human. By the way, remember how uh, Marco in Porco Rosso didn't see himself as a human and turned into a pig and how that was also Miyazaki. Um, the idea yeah. of like people not seeing themselves as human and kind of get, existing outside of the world or trying to exist out of this world with their cynicism is in the same way like something also that is linked with creativity, with creating art. And the things that animate, that move, are creativity, therefore feminine, right? So Grandma Mara is just that Fujimoto as an artist has access to this unlimited creative force that Grandma Mara sort of... Uh, uh, embodies and that gives faith faith to sailors and that is like the iconic like iconography of like liberation and hope and mercy and all of those things but at the same time this makes fujimoto like distinct from the world in which he thinks these values aren't properly um expressed and ironically this makes him one of the people who contributes to a world where we aren't really fully using the values of grandma mara by his anxiety of hybridity, right? Or his, his afraidness of the other side. Instead of like yeah. demonizing the land, what, what Fujimoto does, Grandma Mara is completely able to embrace the land and the people on it, right? Um, Fujimoto thinks the land is dangerous and will spoil his children, will ruin Ponyo. Like he pretty much deliberately thinks so because he's of the opinion that, you know, the people in the world cannot appreciate this. And... You know, there's a complicated mediation of, you know, what is a parent to do if they know, you know, the world is shit. I don't want my children to experience this. But also, like, you know, the children will find happiness in the world if you let them live and experience things. You know, this is like the balance we're striking here. Yeah, it's really interesting how Grand Mamare, like, um, in in that crazy scene where there's the, the huge wave under the the moon and all of the boats are like stuck on it because all of their engines have stopped and 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 you know uh koishi and his like crewmate like do some some prayers and you know uh to grandma mara as she passes but but like they're uh she she restarts the engine of their boat so like you know she's not she's not abandoning like these people from from the land right uh and I just think that it's kind of, um, I don't know exactly how to take that, but it, it, it speaks to sort of her, um, like, chaotic, um, like, neutrality towards, um, towards all life, including mm. humans. She's chaotic neutral, yes. <laughs> yes, she <laughs> is. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, getting back to the hybridity thing, I think it's important to notice that maybe the film is is saying a larger thing, like we see with Ponyo, and where it's like maybe there is no like real difference between life in the sea and life on the land. Maybe it's all life, and Grandma Mari kind of understands that and appreciates mm. it. So she kind of is a she's like a goddess of the sea, but all the sailors, of course, uh, like worship yeah, her all as well. From sea foam. I mean, right. that is definitely where we end, right? The flood kind of immerses the land, but humans continue to exist. Human community continues mm. to exist. They, 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 you know, you see the men in their boats trying to go on a big rescue mission and everyone is still around, but just now the flood, the catastrophe has imposed, uh, gotten rid of some of the structure and order of the world and has kind of, you know, people still exist. They still hope, they still pray to the goddess, they still admire, love, blah, blah, blah. And um, but the world has fused, right? The 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 strong, rigid distinction of those two worlds is gone. There is no way to sustain this anymore. And there comes some, you know, starting pains with um, the merger of the world that is uh, 
depicted as a catastrophe. And indeed, I mean, we can talk at length, uh, although we don't need to, but we can talk at length about how over the last hundred years, for example, destabilizing gender roles or capitalist mo mo modes of production or, you know, governments or natural catastrophe, ecological, ecological destruction, have f uh, brought about collisions of different worlds into which people weren't equipped to be socialized yet, which amounts to various catastrophes on all levels. Let's think about the recurring motif in otaku fiction, the absent fathers, where almost every otaku shown in manga, anime protagonist or whatnot does not have a father or the father is gone somewhere or uh, mm -hmm. there's no connection to the father, like in Evangelion. Like the idea that the family isn't stable, the father figures aren't stable, all of this stuff... Um, is sort of channeled in this catastrophe narrative, a world that is where worlds collide, where order falls apart, where, you know, there is constant hybridity and uncertainty even, the instability. And we are kind of cast into this. And Miyazaki has uh, this to say about Ponyo in response to this, right? He wanted, he says, this story is about a boy and a girl, love, responsibility, the ocean and life all of them depicted in the most basic way as a response to afflictions and uncertainties of our times. He's keeping it pretty vague, but I hope, I, I think, I captured some of the things that he's worried about and outlined as the catastrophes and instabilities and worries and changes of his times that he thinks children will face growing up. Mm -hmm. As they grow up, they, they lose their magic, as, as Ponyo has to do. Well, here's, an inter here's the interesting thing, okay, about the magic. So the idea is you will give up your magic, you will become a real human girl. But um, I found it more interesting that Fujimoto's speech is sort of overwritten by Grandma Mara, who says, will you love Ponyo as a fish and as a girl, like in all her forms? And that kind of, to me, suggests that there's a different dynamic, that there's a part of mm -hmm. the fish that Ponyo will not lose, that will not disappear all her life, and that... Uh, right. uh, uh, Even Sosuke if she needs loses... to show that he's able to love her in all of these forms, because none yeah, of them will go right. away. Even um, if he, even if she loses the magic that is, you know, the innocence of childhood. Um, I really need to go to the bathroom. Uh, ah. I'll be back. We can have um, a quick break if you want. Yeah, should, yeah, should we take ten or something? Right. Yeah. yeah, let's let's all take right. a little break. That that should be fine. Are we gonna right. bring? Because I did bring it up, but I feel like it's it's like a scene that uh, I I still try, try to wonder. Because yeah, we we talk about these things about um, like a hybridity and like a new kind of gender roles, but then like we have the scene with the couple and the baby. That's like the most weirdly like idealistic uh, trad con thing imaginable. <laughs> like they look like they're dressed from like the fifties, like on this just lovely little gondola, and there's like the the wife who's healthy and young and got the baby, I mean, and we're the all father here. rowing the boat. And we're all yeah. here, so let's get right into it, right? All right, right from there. <laughs> I thought, we can I just thought you started right? without me. <laughs> no, 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 no. Just brainstorming. Yeah. So about that, I thought it was kind of interesting. I mean, we we shouldn't forget that there is. We, we don't have Miyazaki with like post-gender takes, right? This is absolutely not what it is. Hmm. He proposes a hybridity, but in his design document, he already says, you know, Ponyo is pure feminine principle. She's like the pure feminine essence. And what it means to be feminine in this movie is a bit more complicated than like traditional gender roles. But the nurturing, caring, caretaking is a part of what he considers still part of the feminine essence. And so, of course, Ponyo also exhibits those traits. So I don't necessarily feel that this is a, uh, that we should read this as a tradcon thing. So we can easily compare it to like Disney's Little Mermaid, where it's like, I went into this earlier, that the there's interestingly this dynamic where the Ariel escapes from the beautiful, radiant under, uh, underwater world, which is rich and vibrant, and desires a uh, living a life on the, uh, uh, you know, over the water with her prince, where it is actually mundane and the animation isn't even capable of selling to us like the beauty or wonder <laughs> of the world at yeah. all. So what happens is that instead of seemingly desiring liberation and becoming like a free girl with, in, with agency over her life, she actually just wants like the tradcon lifestyle of a good husband and a house and all of that shit, like the prince. And that's what she wants. That is what she escaped from the water for. And this is where we are different in Ponyo. So while Ponyo can display these affinities to traditionally feminine things like nurturing, like, you know, taking care of the baby, like 
having this feeling towards children. She, at the same time, still is completely driven by her will and her choice of world is not one codified as like a removal of beauty, richness, creativity, and freedom, but instead that her freedom is channeled in this hybridity into, you know, a more complicated and nuanced understanding of womanhood, of femininity. Um, you know, like, I, I, I think the best, like, place to point to uh, to, to, to show what, like, what, what what is meant by, like, oh, th they are their genders, like, the, this sort of gender essentialism that, 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 that Miyazaki does, like, sort of b believe in, although it's, like, more complicated than that, is that both Ponyo and Sosuke, like, exhibit qualities of their gender despite their parental figure being absent yeah um so like so like uh, sosuke like his his father is clearly like very away very often and clearly he has learned a lot from his mom about like about you know being a caretaker uh and and stuff like that but at the same time he has this he 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 has that uh that captain's uh, hat he he goes uh, around with And he has this take charge attitude uh, of of a problem solver of a of a sort of leader that like that is associated with masculinity, and Ponyo, while her mother is like uh, very absent because she's a goddess, she she she's got other stuff to do, you know, a very free spirit. Um, she we we of course have that scene with with the gondola with the with the very traditional uh, mother with the baby. Where she also has has these like strong parental instincts that that like get 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 activated there. Hmm. Well, here, here, there's there's almost always like a distinction for Miyazaki in this movie of like good masculinity, bad masculinity. Um, one of the things he sees as like bad is, for example, two different things. First of all, controlling masculinity, like with Fujimoto yeah. trying to impose his will on everything not being a leader let's say but being like a dictator uh, someone controlling and hindering freedom of especially children um, another aspect however is the shirking of responsibility that um, and Miyazaki mentions this in an interview and he says it's not in the movie but Koichi dreams of being becoming like an ocean faring captain of like a cool like you know ship on the ocean and not just a fisher or whatever yeah he's n nostalgic for this nautical age that, yes. that he's not in you know. exactly so Koichi only stays because he knows Lisa would probably kill him <laughs> if, he, if, he, if he'd do this. But like the idea still is that there's an aspect to which Koichi is like caught up in these old masculine dreams of like co conquering the sea and so on, and thus is sort of running away. The good sort of masculinity, which is why Miyazaki says you can't have a male hero unless it's a little boy, is just this like innocent, naive courage and principledness. This doing good and insisting on the goodness of your principles or by your own merit and not with like the idea of control not with the idea of escape not with some like weird romanticist fantasies behind them but just purely that bravery courage but and here's the trick right uh, i think i don't know if we had the discussion on laputa but i've had the discussion about laputa before that uh, some someone has complained that it's a little bit gender essentialist and that uh, uh shita Uh, uh, has not really much agency in this film and that Pazu basically does all the cool things. But I really needed to make the case, I think I made it in that cast, even though it's almost two years ago, so I don't even remember all that well, but I think I made the point that the only way that Pazu and Shita ultimately save the day is by giving each other the courage, by both being courageous, not by only the boy giving the lead. And I think in Ponyo and Sosuke's case, it is the same. Ponyo's energy and so on is really important when, remember the scene, when Sosuke finds the car of Lisa yes. and no Lisa inside. And Ponyo is there to calm him down, to put his mind at ease, to console him and to help him get the courage to, hey, let's go and find Lisa. And immediately afterward, there's the tunnel when Sosuke has to say, well, be brave, Ponyo, we got to get through this. They give each other courage. This is really, really yeah. important. Yeah, it's such a beautiful friendship. Uh, also, um, Talking about the Laputa thing, I do remember that, yeah, I, f I feel like I made this case in the Norska uh, episode, our very first one, that, yeah, Miyazaki's always had this thing where he's, he is kind of gender essentialist, but his, like, view of what gender should be is, like, pretty different. Like, he has this, like, this kind of, like, new wave that he feels um, men and women should be acting, that they're not currently, like, in society. Uh, and I think that's... That's pretty much on display. I think we also said it in Mononoke as well. Like that's uh, 
a very prevalent theme. Uh, while we are appreciating women, and interestingly enough, I mean, mm. we are recording this on Mother's Day, so I <laughs> feel yes. like... Shout out to the moms. It's American Mother's Day. Yeah. <laughs> shout, 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 out, shout, shout out to, to Lisa. Yeah. Um, actually, the person I, I, I want mommy. to... <laughs> person I want to shout out, and God, I feel terrible because... Yeah, here, here she is. Uh, Michio Yasuda. She is. She brought to you the beautiful colors in this movie, and by the way, in just about every... Ghibli or Miyazaki work, like way back to Future Boy Conan, she is in all of these works, we've not mentioned her yet, but she is like one of the oldest co-workers of Miyazaki, has been with him from the start and has colorized, has given us all these beautiful colors in every one of these movies and shorts. I don't even know if there's an exception to that rule. Um, she's wow. she's a goddess. She's fucking powerful. Mm -hmm. um, she yes. died, I think, five years ago. So oh. obviously for the next works, she will not be along to, you know, enrich these movies with her beautiful choices of color palettes. But for Ponyo, she did. And I think it's an exceptionally well, you know, rounded and amazingly consistent color palette, with, which yeah, gives every the, frame the, vibrancy and, you know, yeah, just like pastels, even like the, the, the stormy nights are like filled with like these, these nice uh, grayish blues and greens. Yeah, there's always a glow that has, you know, and, and, and light is always refracting off of different surfaces with so many different colors of the rainbow. Um, Hipster mentioned earlier in, the, uh, in, the, in this cast, like how there's, there's one notable exception to this, this film's like extremely bright and sunny and almost shadowless um, like color palette and light um, light scheme right and that's the 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 scene with the tunnel and um and that it becomes very very dark and ponyo's like i don't like this place and you know they get they go forward and um maybe we want to talk about that uh, the, the tunnel at this point because i think the yeah, tunnel definitely. is like really an, an important um like mythological signifier yeah we have i think we can approach the tunnel from three different ways uh, one of them would be, well, liminal spaces. Remember the Spirit Away cast where all we did was talk about limited spaces? Yeah, that. Oh, I, com um, I completely forgot all of it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I, I, I went back through the tunnel and now I, I, I barely remember it, although I do have a small token that reminds me of the way it changed me. Yes. <laughs> um, but also, I think, Platon, you wanted to bring this up, the, you know, passing into the afterlife, into the world of the dead. Yes, so I, th I think Susan Napier's among the the, the, uh, the the scholars and critics that uh, that that took that reading of uh, of the final part of the movie, um, in which like they after the, the the kids like cross through the uh, the tunnel, we see the um, the old folks' home in this bubble, uh, this light light bubble that that resembles a jellyfish, and. And in there we have 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 all these uh, these old ladies who are like freed from their um, f from from their uh, ro what what the hell are they called rolling chairs not no wheelchairs 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 yeah sorry uh, ha had a little uh, uh, bilingual brain fart there um, and uh, and and are like running running around and happy and uh, and the goddess Grandma Mara is there. Uh, and 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 this is like where the final like big decision has to has to be made, um, and I I I think there's there's something to be said for the uh, for the interpretation that you agree with what some of the old women are like considering like that this is actually like a sort of afterlife where um, uh, or, or perhaps even that like after the storm. Is already a sort of afterlife uh, where you have this um, this festival uh, parade of uh, of boats uh, coming along, and everything is like tranquil and right with the world, and and there's no real like suffering to uh, to talk about, you know, and and the, and the like, and the god the goddess is walking among us, you know. Yeah, um, I, th I think yeah. there's something to it, um, although apparently uh, the, the the great Mister M himself uh, disagrees. Yeah, Miyazaki. I'd like to extrapolate on. Yeah. Oh. Go on, go on, uh, please. Okay, I'd like to extrapolate on that idea about um, 
about it being a sort of uh, an afterlife. And, you know, we see the, the, the old women, like, regain a youthful, like, uh, energy and um, freedom of movement and stuff. And I think that it's kind of like there's a mechanical aspect to this or like a like a, a physics aspect to this because they're even though they they can breathe they're in this underwater space so their bodies are actually lighter in that you know density right and and, and they're, they're kind of flowing with the currents and that's cool from the animation perspective but like it's this afterlife right it's it it pronounces when when the children go through the tunnel right it's like it pronounces the death of this old world order of of you know, traditional masculinity and oh, femininity, yeah. femininity, and so, um, and, and all of all of that old world is literally underwater, right? <laughs> the, the 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 edifices of, you know, uh, modern society are, are now buried, but yet humanity still lives, right? It's it's this that is the afterlife. It's like, you know, going beyond the current form of life where there are. You know, not only is there like, you know, uh, you know, ecological like abuse and and you know pollution and things like that, and this enmity em- between humanity and nature, but also the inherent like um, conflict of of masculinity and femininity can be, you know, left under the sea. And that's some uh, uh, that's some contrast in relation to um. Like Future Boy Conan, obviously, where they're mm. they're also like the the past world is entirely buried by the sea, mostly. Yeah, and Miyazaki and likes that theme. <laughs> that, that's true. Uh, there's multiple works in which Miyazaki has depicted a flood coming to you know bury a good chunk of the world, and I think I should also talk about Panda Copanda at some point, but. For now, I want to put it at at the, at the side. We will return to this because the tunnel. Platon mm. proposed the idea of the afterworld, and voice what you just explained sounded to me more like a liminal space, not necessarily the afterworld as in they died, but the, the that we have a transition from one place to another, in which like the hybridity sort of exerts itself. Right, um, the third yeah. proposal. And this one comes from Big M himself and also from, from Big N. So me, that's me, and Miyazaki. We, we agree on this. <laughs> my boy Miyazaki and I. So we sat yeah. down for tea and we talked about it. And <laughs> okay. Basically, he explained, not, not, not with tea, i got to be real, uh, with an interview. I think it's one of the interviews I watched or read. I actually don't remember. I need to figure out which exact one it was to put into the sources. But um, that he had been confronted with the theory that it was a passing into the afterlife. And he said, well, you know, it's not technically impossible, but I don't see it that way because the way I think about tunnels, and he's very cool about this because he says it's a possible reading, you know, he, he just allows it. Mm-hmm. But the way I see it, he says, is um, that tunnels in Japan are often, um, you know, you encounter them often as you go like through mountains and it used to be that tunnels were like really rough. Nowadays, they're all like lit up and like neat roads and escape tunnels and everything. Back in the day, they used to be that like basically only one car fits through them and that they had very bumpy road. And that for him simply to transition from one place to the next, he thinks like the road and this road we can understand metaphorically is often, you know, suffused with like hurdles and tunnels that make the ascent mm-hmm. or the way more difficult. And he likened it to life itself, that life itself has its fair share of tunnels that you need to pass through. So for him, merely uh, instead of like signifying the afterworld or the end of the world, it is indeed a transitionary thing that he locates in time. But like, from one place to the next as a hurdle. So it is something difficult to overcome, which kind of reflects mm-hmm. again in what I personally proposed about the mutual giving of courage and encouragement that in these two scenes right after one another, Ponyo and Sosuke need to do for each other. So that is at least how I and, and my boy Miyazaki conceived of the tunnel. Mm-hmm. So Yeah, mm-hmm. that, that makes a lot of sense because the way I always read the tunnel, or at least I guess the tunnel and then the, the events that come directly after it. They're they're almost like this like little like mythical trial Sosuke goes on right before the end of the film because he mm. goes into the tunnel and like everything on the film up until this point from Sosuke has been pretty been pretty peachy. 
uh, like Ponyo showed up and they just had nothing but fun. They go out on the little boat and it's been a great little adventure. Uh, but then um, he loses his mother. Like he, the, the mum is just not where he th- uh, thinks uh, she is. And so he's like worried and he's almost crying. And then Ponyo starts to slowly lose her magic and her form. And she um, like th- there's that great scene where she's walking in slowly flopping and sagging down to the side, reverting back to her fish form slowly. Mm. So Ponyo is like losing all the important people in his life. And then when he gets out of the tunnel, uh, his little confrontation with Fujimono, who, because Sosuke doesn't really know him, he kind of like sees him as just this weirdo who's kind of like trying to tempt him to get Ponyo away from him. So he's kind of immediately put through these like three trials of like, things in his life that he thought were certain and were great are now like suddenly like going real bad and he's so kind of in like this really uh, dramatic hardship and he has still yeah. but again of course afterwards he still decides to be with Ponyo because even though he knows life won't always be good things can be taken away from him he can lose the people closest to him life is still worth living it's still worth pursuing a life with Ponyo than it is yeah, to like run away from your problems I also very love much how shows like the footprints of uh, like the fairy tale remnants. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's like a very fairy tale setup almost. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I also love how like his his response when asked there, like there's no deliberation. There's not a second of doubt of thought. It's just like, what are you talking about? Like, of of course I love Ponyo always, forever. Like, no matter mm-hmm. what form she takes, like, there's no question. It's it's, it's not really which which is kind of like. I, I, I think it's actually like kind of a weakness of the movie that it like spends a lot of time setting up the all these like these plot threads, this grave end of the world thing. That there's this specific shot that's kind of goofy where Fu- Fujimoto is is like, uh, you don't understand. Look at the moon. If it comes in closer, like the world will end and stuff. And, and we just like move the camera up there to be like, oh right, that's the thing, because like, <laughs> the, because thing. like the 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 movie like doesn't like. For the most part, like the main characters and by extension, like us as the audience, like we're not like really supposed to care that much because it's not really a visible thing to the like the the core character arcs of the story. And the way that we have all this set up to this dramatic finish with, with our, oh, now we, we have this hardship and now he, ha- he must make the fateful choice. And there's no real, it's, it doesn't really have the, the drama that it's sort of setting up because there's not no not really any any question that they like he he loves Ponyo and Ponyo, Ponyo loves him like but the world still kind of ends this is like uh, i guess i guess this is a great point like i have like i have wondered about the use of apocalyptic imagery in this movie because yeah it is undramatic almost at times it is very matter of fact the kids even have fun with it like we mm-hmm. have so the first question that poses itself to me in this is exactly why Ponyo's transformation is what creates the the imminent apocalyptic danger for the community and especially, and this is really important, I want to understand this symbolically, and especially the risk for Koichi to never return. So Ponyo deciding to grow legs, break out from Fujimoto's control, incidentally makes her tipple over the elixir. But how does do we relate, so in our analysis so far, that Ponyo's exertion of agency creates not only a risk to Koichi, the father, very important, but also a risk to human community at large. Like, what is this... Cra- because we've so far treated it as, as like, yeah, the world is unstable. The world is uh, complicated. Worlds are crashing and falling apart. Old norms don't hold water, <laughs> literally. Um, hmm. <laughs> but it is Ponyo's agency... It's a stupid which, bucket starts this so just to uh, my, my, my reading of this was always that um again it's kind of like you said about the hybridity where it's like ponyo is trying to I mean, we can attach a lot of things like gender or whatever to to this but again it's it, it works in a vague kind of metaphor where like ponyo is trying to transgress the boundaries that she was raised in and that her parents told her that she had to be like and she tries to like uh, become something else. She becomes something that she believes she'll be more happy as, and will be more like fulfilling in life. And this, of course, causes like from the adult. Because again, I think the important thing is that the kids and like never noticed the apocalypse. Almost like we said, uh, Fujimoto had to point out that the moon was about to hit, like hit the Earth or whatever. Like the kids like never even paid attention to it. They were too busy having fun in the apocalypse. 
So it's almost like the adult world is like adults fear the future their children could create because they feel it will be like wrong and not balanced and an apocalypse from their perspective. But the children, they just kind of want to like like live like their own lives. They kind of want to just do whatever, you know, they want to pursue their own happiness. Mm. And at the end Brilliant. of the movie, Sosuke and Ponyo had to accept the responsibilities of becoming adults and of like keeping a balance in the world. That's while such still a kind good of like reading. maintaining that childhood so good. Like, joy. That is such a good reading. To, that, thank you for that. Because like the destruction of the world hinges on Sosuke's love to Ponyo, which is of course another trope of otaku media, I kind of feel like. Like the big idea of that you have like an apocalyptic narrative framed by lovers, by mm. couples, by interrelationships between multiple people. Like think about the big, the big, uh, 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 um, what's the big Shikin, Shinkai Shinkai movies? Uh, like both Kimi oh, no, no Nawa Ko. and Tanki no Ko have this theme very strongly. But a lot. Of, I was I was going to say yeah. Gurren Lagann. The whole story is Gurren fighting Lagan? the entire universe to get your girlfriend back. The whole Absolutely. last part of Gurren One hundred percent. Lagann is also kind of a fairy tale, yeah. Yeah, and. This theme keeps coming up that the relationship between like two specific people is synonymous with like the fate of the world, the end of the world hinges on mm -hmm. the love of these two people. And you just perfectly kind of gave me an answer to how I was wondering what it specifically means in this film. Because as you said, um, Ponyo's transformation and Ponyo and Sosuke's relationship poses a question for the world, a danger, something where the previous generation worries that the world is going to break apart, that all the old norms are going to be broken, that now men are going to be sleeping with fish, you know, all that good stuff. Um, <laughs> and it yeah, is going to be sleeping with the fishes, see? Yeah. And, and, it, and it is the love of these children to each other, the kind of faithfulness and principledness and, you know, relationship they construct to support each other, but also in the eyes of the previous generation, the hope that children can create a future worth living. You know, that is kind of yeah. like why it hinges on this. If these kids manage to live like they do, more free and more liberated than we expected they would, if they can do that with their eyes unclouded, with their lack of cynicism, not running away, not being restricted by social norms, then maybe this world is world worth living in, which really ties back into like Miyazaki watching children play in the Ghibli daycare and being like, yeah, this, this is good. This is the good shit. Hmm. Definitely. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, okay. that, 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 you know, that perspective of the older generation, like watching carefully, like what are the children going to do? Are they going to completely topple this world? Like these old norms that give our world structure, are they going to, you know, destabilize them and is the world going to be destroyed? Well, oh, yeah. you know who's you know who's not concerned about that? It's the elderly people that are in the in the um aha, you know, that that, that nursing home and, and 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 well except for Toki. And she's really important in this. Remember when she sees Ponyo for the first time, she says, "Oh no, a fish with a face. Throw it back into the water because if you have a fish with a face, a tsunami will come." Yep. She's invoking the, you know, the folklore tale of the ningyo, like the mermaid fish, whatever, like a fish with face, with a face, and it will bring disaster if you have such a fish. Here we have this theme that we've talked about, right? The weight of narratives of old, like folk superstition and like preconceptions as to what is normal and acceptable and what isn't. So Toki embodies this. She's like always skeptical and standoffish and kind of strict with Sosuke and really against Ponyo at first, but we have her transformation, right? She resembles exactly your point then, voice, like the older generation yeah. that becomes then n not so worried about the children anymore, that they will actually right. be able to do it somehow, that they will actually be able to continue to live in this world and continue. To maybe gain a glimpse of the perspective of the children. Like, like go back to the scene where, you know, um, Sosuke presents the old ladies with like, little red goldfish and she and, and he gives Toki the boat that his you know yep. little paper boat and she sees it as a cricket and he says well no it's a boat and she can't see it by his perspective he's <laughs> like well it still kind of looks like a cricket to me <laughs> or a grasshopper or something you know it's she she can't see things from his perspective yet oh also just wanted to cut in uh I was just thinking about this uh now 
uh, I, I, yeah, talking about seeing things from the different perspective, I noticed that, yeah, Fujimoto has to point to the moon to point out the thing. Another great parallel <laughs> is in the opening scene of the film, not the opening, the, the one where we first meet, um, Sosuke meets Ponyo. Mm. Uh, Sosuke, there's like those weird, um, like yokai wave monster things that Fujimoto creates. Yeah, the omibozo. Uh, yeah, yeah. And they chase after him, but he doesn't even know they're there because he's so concerned with the Ponyo. Like, he just, like, turns his back and they just, he d- runs up and he doesn't even realize he's escaped them. But then the it's second like, time that, that in the film, weird. he consciously is running away from them because he sees Fujimoto send them after him directly. And that's after he's gone through the tunnel and he's now, like, understanding that there is danger in the adult world, that you can no longer, like, live a life of complete uh, um, naivety to the, like, dangers and hardships of the world. Gosh, your reads are really fire today, hipster. No, I'm just so great at this. <laughs> <laughs> to, uh, to go back on perspective, um, I feel like um, children and the super old uh, are like very much connect to each other via um, like outside of you know, uh, I forget her name, uh, blue blue clove Toki individual Toki. Um, yes, Be- because and, like you can kind of see this in in the fact that like. Um, um, the, the two that Sosuke had talked to a lot uh, are in wheelchairs and they're essentially in like at his level, head level. And that's something that you often do with children if you want to like let them know that like they are equal. Obviously, they couldn't walk, but like it's it still helps with the point of saying that they are on kind of equal terms of like um like they treat life as a curious thing as much as Sosuke does. Well, it almost comes from a wrong. place of, yeah, yeah, I agree with you. They're, they're more willing to see it from the child's perspective because these elderly people, they've, they've lived life um, in, in this world where, where there's, um, they've been beaten down by, by the previous, you know, order and, and they're tired and they, they kind of are just like, they're kind of like Miyazaki in that they're like, they they hope for something new. They they really need the hope that these children provide. Mm-hmm. Because yeah, because they're tired. Also, yeah. um, maybe this is just my reading reading on it. I don't think the movie shows this too much, but there's kind of always been a thing when you see a lot of old people homes, particularly where they depict it in like like movies and stuff. There's it's kind of always an infantilization of old people because they're so needing to be looked after so constantly that they're almost mm-hmm. like children again. Yeah, uh, which is a thing I perspe- a perspective Miyazaki again shows because it's like children kind of give life to old people and yeah. we see uh, in the scene where they're underwater and they can run again they're kind of just like just the idea that they can run and chase each other is just like so unbelievably joyous to them right, uh, they treat it almost like they're yeah. in ki- kindergarten again yeah and, we, we always bring this up with the movies yeah. that like no one ever truly grows up you're always the child yeah. on the inside mm-hmm. adulthood the, uh, is merely sort of, a performative um, state you're yeah, this, in. this is sort of getting back to, to uh, a, a, a thing that um that, that that I found uh, in, in my reading up on, uh, on on this whole thing um it's from uh oh, hang on a second sorry just got a lot of stuff open at yeah, this I, point I, okay let me just quickly add that <laughs> yeah, you know go, go, go ahead. earlier go ahead. you said the walking plate i think you said they can only walk because they're underwater but later on they get out of the water and to top side and there's like sailors trying to help them like hey old ladies let us help you and they're like nope we can walk alone fuck yeah. off and That's they just maybe it was just a miracle stop. maybe it was just a miracle well, all along well, I, no I it, it, is, it is the theme of juice. getting hope by children that is basically mm-hmm. what i think it is it's not yeah. just miracle juice it is like this act of seeing ponyo and sosuke being able to you know love each mm. other like this and promise a future gives hope therefore yeah. you know the debilitating age curse is kind of lifted a little bit mm. well, it's the uh, freedom I thought, I of the, the chaotic you know ocean this 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 primal you know femininity is this you know it's it's free and it's it's creative and like un, un like unshackling that uh that kind of femininity is what allows you know the, the everybody to have this new perspective yeah, um, it it also sort of get, 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 gets around to this uh, idea that I stumbled upon uh, uh, doing research. Um, this is bu- this book by uh, by Lucy uh, Fraser called uh, "The Pleasure of uh, Metamorphosis," uh, which is about like the, the the mermaid figure and and like different um, mm. uh, and, and and different like 
takes on on that genre and um and, and in a chapter where she uh you know once again again the classic you compare a uh, disney's the little mermaid to uh, to ponyo um she uh she quotes a literary critic uh maida i who um uh who, who who talks about this uh idea of uh, like this cultural idea of childhood and and separates it into like three different like visions of childhood For, um Uh, she writes, uh, firstly, there's uh, the child's existence at something that will, quote, become something. Uh, the figure of the child who encapsulates the process of becoming an adult. Secondly, there's the concept of the innocent or pure child, the child world as a utopia for adults that adults can return home to. And finally, there's the child who is just like the child as a child, Um Uh, like like that uh, encapsulate uh, it says here like a range of possibilities that adults do not have um or or, or again a, an attempt to like d discover uh, the creation like the, the original uh like personhood and i th I, i think that's like a really really interesting way of looking at this movie because i think mm -hmm. um It, we, we've compared it, of course, to uh, uh, to Laputa because it has this male-female uh, young pairing, um, like, like pre-romantic pairing, sort of. Um, and it we've also compared it to Totoro because it has this childlike wonder about it. And, and I think it's more of a piece with Totoro, except um, where where Totoro like sort of like embodied like the, the, this whole like child as child experience. Um, and, and and sort of was v very in tune with like the the child mentality and is therefore like a really really fantastic movie for children. I think Ponyo is much more interested in children as a thematic element, as like something to examine through the movie, like hmm. the childhood innocence and joy and uh, and the and, and all these various right? elements of it. Um, I, I think Miyazaki is generally. M much more in like the, the column a the whole like a child as like s something of potential something that is becoming over time uh and 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 you can sort of see his fascination with um with, uh, like again these um these pre-romantic pairings like the, the, there's the, there's there's some fascination with like imagining how they might be as as grown-ups but at the yeah. same time he he also like uh like go, goes uh, in, in these other directions and, and and that's why i like uh i came to think of this what was specifically because you have uh the adults who maybe see the children as like some sort of aspirational like something like oh mm -hmm. I, i wish i could, could go back there to uh, to run around and and be creative but the crucial thing is they do they succeed hooray you know the the, the old ladies they 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 see it they can they can run now they can they're strong again You know, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, I also think, though, that like, yes, the, the children are definitely becoming something. They're, they're moving into adulthood, but they also have this capability that the adults don't have, which is to create a new uh, paradigm, right, uh, right, between them. And so they, they sort of, even though they are in the process of becoming what they do that the adults can't do is is choose to go in a new direction in their in their uh, process of becoming which puts them in category C the the really significant right. ones that exactly the child has a range of possibilities that adults do not have and you know that children can tap into that see with eyes unclouded maybe um to call mm. back to another movie um to really um understand though what kind of like this movie does to children is also really important to think about that this movie is not just about children and interesting reflecting on children but also really very much for children and interestingly enough the main lesson that Miyazaki wants to teach aside from you know kids uh, you could create a new world you know all of that good stuff the the values that he kind of encodes in the movie is also simply that children could, should go outside and touch grass um, <laughs> yeah. Same with Totoro. He like grass. when you touch water. Yeah. When 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 we yes. talked about Totoro, we basically mentioned how Miyazaki was hoping that children would go into the woods to, you know, um, explore and, and 
try to find a Totoro in their own. <laughs> find <books>. a Totoro. <laughs> yeah. They see a bear and they're like, oh, let's go sleep on the Totoro. <laughs> you know, that would be a problem. But, you know, um, I mean, no, it, there's this, that? the same with the <laughs> ocean. I think Miyazaki is fine oh, with no. like having kids do dangerous stuff just a little yeah. bit. I think he thinks that's kind of <laughs> yeah. cool. Um, but I, this I is really central to him. Yeah, this is really central to Ponyo because, like, not only is the message of the film, you know, children can start to create a new world, but also children should be able to look at the world and experience it with with, with joy. Um, earlier, I yeah. mentioned the comparison to Little Mermaid, where somehow the world above the water was boring and mundane. Well, one of the main reasons Miyazaki didn't make the world above the water mundane and boring is, as we said, he tried to idealize it, make the world seem more livable. He wanted the children watching his movie do not get absorbed in a fantasy world but instead use the real world as their canvas and see the real world mm -hmm. with new eyes of excitement and hope Ooh, and creation to call back to the last podcast to 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 see the world with iblard eyes yes kind of like that as well yeah the real, um, the real message of the movie don't grow up to be like your new male dad who just is never <laughs> <laughs> Unironically, though, I mean, yeah. Howl is also a story about how pissed off uh, uh, Miyazaki is at new males. <laughs> <laughs> well, and yeah, I mean, it, yeah. it's just Miyazaki being like, "Get your shit together," and also look at this beautiful shit. This that, truly that's, is that's Miyazaki's Fight Club. Go touch grass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, go touch some grass. No, but, but I, I think also, um, like, what, what, what's also special about Ponyo is like the, the character of Ponyo and just the absolute like joy of that character in like every moment. She's uh, like from, from the moment she figures out how to be human, it's all like it's it, it's such an amazingly animated like s character with so much personality and, and the force of personality that's like enacted upon the movie. Like the uh, I, I, I honestly like um Ponyo's escape um, from uh, from a prison where when she first uh, turns into a human and like rides towards the surface and then later when she comes like crashing across the coast running atop the, these forming and unforming uh, like giant fish made of seawater it's just absolutely phenomenal stuff like yeah. it, it's one of the like the greatest Miyazaki sequences. It's so and his Taishi so score is in bombastic. Miyazaki movies. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I mean, it, and it has it calls back. Uh, Hisaishi wrote that, um, you know, theme, calling to Wagner's Ride of the Valkyries and like, yeah, um, yeah just and like another, making another it the most like heroic yeah. like bombastic. Da, 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 da. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that, that, that's how it goes. And, and it's also another like reference to Wagner's uh, opera on top of. Ponyo's mm -hmm. uh, original name being P Bunhilde. Um, yeah. no, but but just um, but 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 even after that, like like that, just absolute insane flex of animation prowess. That that like every single moment, like like when she's in the house, the way she runs around and jumps around mm. and looks at things and and gets excited. Uh, it's just like, like there's so much. Like Wiggles her effort toes. and talent and <laughs> and and well like well observed detail on display. Uh, it's just it's just a joy to look at. Is is the thing? Like e e even um, e even though I have some reservations about like like the uh, the plot structure stuff like that. Like just the aesthetics of it really do carry it. It is very much an aesthetically driven film, I guess. <clears throat> to harken back to our discussions about the production, right? When I asked all of you to keep in mind the idea that somehow, like the o under under the ocean is sort of the unconscious that bubbles over and spills into the real world and messes with everything. I think if this tells us one thing, then that this film isn't uh, much, isn't very much directly literally to be understood as like a story of a flooding but that there's like in the artistic intent itself in the art direction in the visuals in the aesthetics codified a huge chunk of its meaning like the ways to see the world and the sort of 
ideas which bubble up from below, how we get into gender and so on, is also like very much tied into unconscious associations with what things do we perceive as gendered and how are people compelled to experience the world gendered in such a way. So I think I really completely forgive the film for being plot-wise very straightforward and very simple and maybe having like a bit of a, a non-conflict. Because, like, the aesthetic presentation is so extremely strong, vivid, vibrant, and, like, psychologically activating, I want to call it, that I hardly can think of any other film that does it quite like this. Like, really just blasts this free association that's bubbling over all of the unconscious of the artists, all all of them who were involved in this production, um, to uh, depict such a vivid frame of life you know and and hope and future and the wishes of the well-being for these children and all of this like it is kind of overwhelming in the pure aesthetic sense which is hmm. quite a, a a feat uh to make yeah, a movie, movie so genuinely abundant. just constantly blew me away because yeah like you say uh, the ocean is the subconscious and the imagination and just like in the film it completely submerges the land takes over everything yeah, and as as Miyazaki was, you know, drawing and animating all this and unlocking his subconscious, he 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 created something that as we were watching the movie, it's unlocking our subconscious. Definitely. The, all the yeah, almonds have so been fully movie. activated now at the end of this cast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like it, 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 as, as, as I mentioned yeah. like yeah, as I mentioned very early in in, in the cast like P- Ponyo really is Miyazaki at 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 the height of his like uh, artistic ability, so of of course the wind rises is, is coming up, but I, I I still think like Ponyo like uh, as a like holistic work of imaginative like uh, art and animation I th- I th- I think is probably the peak, um, mm. and and and, and that's absolutely something to that. But at the same at the same time, it's also uh, Miyazaki at, at at his like at his late uh, stage in in his career. Mm-hmm. Which uh, is is often, as Susan Napier points out, like like you have this late style of great auteur directors where all these contradictions seem to to, to come out of uh, of both um, both both this pessimism that that might come with with age and experience and like like having the perspective you have from uh, from where you're at, and at the mm. same time this. Um, this serenity, this uh, th- this contradictory like like hopefulness that uh, that like shines through, and I, and I think those contradictions are very much present in in, in Ponyo. There's this, um, like like there, there's all this like overjoyous animation and this fascination with with childhood that like as as which represents not just. In, in all sorts of wonder, like the wonder of animation and uh, and cinema and color and imagination and and the wonder of childhood being like associated together, while at yeah. the same time you do have like the, the moon is falling down and and there there are all these questions about like well all, all all of this like energy is like all good and well but there's still the question that like lingers in a, in in the margins of it which adult viewers will make great note of whereas uh, children will just like be happily uh, enjoying it and i suppose like that that's that's a very miyasaki core see here's one of those questions that lingers in the background of the movie but it's quite relevant actually to how this whole movie started out and how sosuke and ponyo were brought together maybe it is hard to pick up on if you're not if you don't like focus on it but there's litter junk garbage trash and everything oh everywhere. Yeah, yeah that as well <laughs> Or everywhere in the water before the flood starts. After the flood, I think the litter and garbage disappears somewhat. But as the mm. flood starts, like you can see Ponyo escaping from a fishing boat as they literally drag their nets through like heaps and heaps and heaps of garbage. It kind of looks like the river spirit and spirit away, where too much bullshit is in that water. Like there's like a bathtub and like a whole bicycle and like half a car and some stupid shit. And Ponyo gets whole trapped fridge. in a little yeah whole fridge. Ponyo gets trapped in a little glass jar, which which is like really re- reminds us of sort of like sea life and other animals being caught in junk and like having their heads stuck yeah. in the pieces of trash that they might like run into, like destroying the environment, the wildlife. So the ecological themes and like, again, the recurring motif that uh, Miyazaki really wants you to go outside and pick up litter uh, 
appears here again uh, in very subtle ways, but as like an inciting moment and as something also driving the catastrophe, because of course we all understand the link between the pollution of the environment and flooding. And that link is definitely not accidental, but the world of the flood basically is coming and our children will have to, you know, live in that world. And I think we see that here pretty present and you know, I've, I've, I've heard this mentioned often by, you know, young adults of, of my age or older talking about, you know, I don't know if I would want children who have to grow up in the world of the climate apocalypse. Like, what is it going to be like? This movie, I think also with this subtlety, powerfully says, you know, even the world after the big flood, so, <clears throat> so to speak, is something for these children to worth living in. You know, I, I think they will also learn to love and appreciate their world. And hmm. this may be a moment where Miyazaki kind of already sees that this catastrophe will come. And ironically or fatefully, maybe three years after the release of Ponyo, the huge Fukushima disaster happened, right? The tsunami that hit the coast and flooded and killed and, you know, radiated tons of people and took many lives. And it's almost like yeah. prophetic how in Ponyo, like we see the apocalyptic image, imageries of submerged Japan shortly before one of the most traumatic catastrophes of the 2010s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it's, it's funny how that movie, um, how Ponyo has kind of become like a reference for that, uh, like before it even happened. Yeah, uh, I was very much again, surprised um, to see it before was yeah. made beforehand. Yeah, because you would think with a lot of the flooding imagery, but of course... Um, Miyazaki has a huge amount of like faith in people because yeah, like we see after all the flooding and all the uh, the magic stuff's finished, the the sea level goes down, but then people are kind of like changed for the better. The old people uh, can now walk again because they've kind of been imbued with that hope. And um, Fujimoto has now kind of changed his ways. He thinks better of humanity. So there's kind of this togetherness. Oddly enough, uh, the the whole message of like coming together and really sorting a problem out and like having faith in each other would be the theme of a, another film about the um, the Fukushima disaster, amazing Shin Godzilla, made by a, one of Miyazaki's protégés, Hideaki Anno. So mm, I like the, that link true. there. They both kind of, on both ends of this disaster, made films that kind of like really deeply relate to it and both have this kind of hopeful view of uh, Japan coming like uh, through these kind of disasters together. And going back to... Fujimoto as like the um, the sort of doomer artist right at the beginning of the <laughs> film, and then you, mean, you you can say Miyazaki, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I yeah, it, I mean it is Miyazaki, and then and then at the at the end of the film, Fujimoto's all up in arms, and he's like you know Clayton, you brought up the scene of where it's kind of goofy, like he's kind of waving his arms, like you know all wacky, and he's pointing at the moon, he's like. The world's getting, gonna get destroyed by the moon. It's like, well, I thought you wanted like the, you know, I thought you wanted like uh, this, yeah. you know, doomer ending, and now now you're like saying that we had to stop it. Oh, I guess like his perspective did change. Like he realized that, hmm, maybe like there's something worth saving here. That humanity isn't all bad. And he, he seemed to be very concerned about Ponyo as well in this regard, right? Um, this kind of intersects with another scene that had me kind of curious and puzzled, which is, and we haven't talked about this at all, Ponyo's sleepiness. It's like kind of like out of a fairy tale, like the magic being, you know, falls asleep mm -hmm. and all the magic fades away and it's almost like she's kind of dying. This is what it feels like in the moment, right? They're all We're worried alongside so Magic Sosuke. slumber, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And Fujimoto is really hyped about this. He wants Ponyo to stay asleep. So that while all this goes down, he can take her back, basically. Mm -hmm. So th this is kind of what it reminds me of. But broadly about sleepiness, I find it interesting that, again, just like with the tunnels, when we bring all these dark readings to the table, which seem to be pretty obvious, right? Like transcending into, into the world of death and uh, dying or like fading of magic. Miyazaki simply has to say, well, hold on, Ponyo is just a five-year-old child. Those fall asleep everywhere. And that's his answer to the <laughs> sleepiness. Like, no joke. <laughs> I awesome. think that's such that's amazing. A... <laughs> I mean, they do like like that. That's another like great part of her character. Is like she has so much energy, but she's also tired all the time. Which, I mean, she's a kid. She tuckers herself out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. A great a great scene. Uh, one one of my favorites. Of course, we were talking about with the ramen. 
in which first, oh, yeah. amazingly, uh, I just love the the way that um, we see Sosuke pour the noodles into the bowl. He kind of shakes them a bit. And so we, of course, see sh- uh, Ponyo, like, shred the shit out of the noodles. <laughs> yeah. and he just pulls yeah. out He's tiny pieces it. in the bowl. And then, she's yeah, so she's excited. super excited. She's not in control of her strength, yeah. you know? She's super excited to get the ham, and she's just, like, eating it while it's still piping hot, and she's running around, and then immediately, like, smash cut to her being almost asleep while still trying to eat, like... <laughs> <laughs> eating so hard she's just completely tired herself out uh, it's, it's great and like i said yeah, it's like delightful. real like the the children feel like so incredibly real they must have like miyazaki clearly influenced mm-hmm. by the daycare oh yeah definitely yeah even even in the very beginning when sosuke is like uh, kind of hiding like like he says he's busy and he's just kind of like standing in, in the entrance of the daycare and it's like that's totally how a kid would like pretend well Baba like "Quote unquote hide something, but very obviously." Yeah, yeah. Oh, there's there's <laughs> another right. really good one. I, I really like this. I felt like this was this hit it the nail right on the head. The scene where uh, he loses Ponyo and he's like looking for her in in the ocean, and he's kind of just wandering mm-hmm. around and he's a bit like confused. Uh, and then immediately his mum picks him up, and the moment uh, she picks him up, he just immediately bursts into yeah. tears and Stop. immediately yeah. starts crying. That Something was like such an, oh my God, I have yeah. seen this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like exactly. every child does that. The moment their parents yeah. are there, they just immediately kind of crying. Yeah, and, and then the, the, the like cut to like, uh, like, like a short few cuts before we see them in the car after having gone shopping and he's sitting there like l- l- licking at melting soft eyes and, and it's like, he, he's clearly had a, had a bad time and then now he's like quieted mm. down. Oh, oh man. And then yeah. Lisa... And then Lisa licks the top of his ice cream cone Fucking while chomps, she's driving. Man. And it's just like, yeah. <laughs> slurp. And, and she's like, mm, that's good. <laughs> she's <laughs> just cry- driving like a mad woman. And I, uh, her driving, by the way, is, um, well, I think my my read of her driving is like, it's kind of like this, because she's pent up and like, um, uh, you know, frustrated because Koichi is always like avoiding her and like not coming home um this is like one of the areas in her life that she's just like kind of reckless and like really mm. um yeah like there's that scene where she's like driving around the corner and she's not in her lane and there's an oncoming car and the car is like <laughs> like sort of like swerves to the side yeah. a little bit yeah and, and well, it's I, like again, like I said, I really read that but... as as Sosuke again, like kind of seeing it from Sosuke's perspective. Or we also get the scene where it's flooding, and she like drives in the dip just as the boat's yeah. coming in, and it's yeah. like, uh, yeah, like she's just the way Sosuke sees her driving is oh. just insanely uh, yeah. competent. Yeah, yeah, if I, could, if I could go for one small personal anecdote, this did kind of happen one time. I believe me and my brother were like very young. And like in the car, and like somehow, like the handbrake wasn't on the car, so the car started like rolling down the road towards like a, the, the main road. Oh, because uh, it's kind of it was on a hill, and it probably wasn't this dramatic because I was like you know five years old when this happened. But I remember my mum <laughs> literally like like a superhero dived into the car while the door was open and grabbed the handbrake and stopped the car. So I immediately always think of that when watching Ponyo. Like this idea that you see your parent as this like impossible like superhero yeah. that can just do this shit yeah. that you you don't know. Mm-hmm. And that, I was really moment. reminded in in the car the car all the car scenes like um that like uh I, like I I was like I I've seen this before. Where is this from? And then I recall like the 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 car chase scene in Castle of Cagliostro. And like, yes, it's even yes. like the same kind of car. I think, like, I don't know, well, maybe, yeah, I, yeah, maybe yeah, I'm restrained. Well, he, he yeah. didn't exactly. put in like, his own clear, car again. Yeah, it's pretty clear that, that like mm. the driving scenes in Ponyo are, in fact, from the same director who made the greatest car chase in cinema history. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Though, yeah I guess it makes sense like because a the kind car of that... on your mark reference in the like in that scene that you had just described to Hipster, where the boat is coming and like, like. Those two dudes had just told her to like not go. They look very similar to the characters in On Your Mark. Um, and then I don't know as, as she like treads mm. forward, the way it's mm. the way the um, the wheel turns. I don't know. It's very much On Your Mark energy for a particular scene where they sort just of like glide. yeah the the, 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 the mad escape right. They're trying to yeah, escape exactly. that side of the mm-hmm. island and it's like you know, yeah. 
Though I do um, really like the car. I guess it makes sense because uh, maybe uh, Miyazaki realized that uh, having the uh, like the '60s car would be a bit too on the nose. So he kind of went with like the modern, tiny little car that like <laughs> he he loves those kind of like uh, economic little cars. I think it's supposed to be based on like an actual Subaru or something. I'm not too sure. Me neither. I'm not a car person. Yeah. <laughs> well, I I, I, I oh. think if if, if we. Um, like if, it, if, if oh sorry go it, ahead it it just struck me actually um the reason that uh, the license plate um is 333 free, free might have to do also with fairy tales in regards to like the very important number of three of like three things happening of like three challenges and stuff i don't know but maybe 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 i mean ponyo has three different stages <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sosuke, like I said, she Sosuke has, faces she has three fish, challenges she has at, fish, the, at the end of the film. She has frog chicken and she has a real girl. <laughs> Correct. I love frog chicken the most. It's so weird looking. <laughs> Powerful. Yeah, it's a, yeah it's, it, 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 I think it's kind of like a kappa, isn't it? Like sort of. Like, well, it doesn't it, really it, look it like the same vibes. Kappa, but yeah, something strange. Yeah. Okay, I googled frog chicken. There's actually results, and they are disturbing. Okay, okay, let's. <laughs> okay, I, I, I think we're, we're like at the point where we're basically just listing little delightful moments from the movie, and if we There's keep so doing many. that, we'll be here all day. We do, yeah, we could do this for another right. hour. Uh, sure. I just want to quickly go a little bit more into Panda Copanda, just briefly, because I think it's like kind of cool to trace evolving ideas and influences of these artists. So. Panda Copanda, for those who don't know, is a series of two short movies for children from 1972 and 1973. They are directed by Isao Takahara, and Miyazaki is the writer and layout, scene designer. I think you made the storyboards as well, like, like all that good stuff. And in Panda Copanda, do you not only find a blueprint to Totoro, as in the big Papa Panda, but also the second movie of the Panda Copanda series is kind of a blueprint for the flooding in Ponyo because as our characters awake in their house they find that overnight it has rained so much that all of the outside is flooded and with the beautiful pastel colors of this 1973 uh, children's film we can kind of follow them around on a very whimsical little journey as they throw their bed into the water, sit on it, and like row through the flooded Japanese town, basically, and find like townspeople that need help, and like they they roll around and they start freeing animals from a circus and all of that good stuff because the animals in the circus kind of got trapped in the water. So I really recommend checking that out in order to sort of get an impression of the imagery of the flooded Japanese city, but also with like light eco themes, I will say, because, you know, the big panda breaks out like all the animals from the circus and frees them as they all ride through the flood um, on the train. It, it's 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 also has these themes very lightly, though, of the sort of um, liberating flood, interestingly enough, that, ch that a child and the companions, the magical companions of that child uh, approach with lightheartedness and whimsy and that way it makes it for an interesting little curiosity in terms of Miyazaki's own artistic history and reusing motifs oh yeah I believe in the Panda Copanda he also uses the train tracks that's like slightly submerged under water which is also yes. the exact thing he uses for Spirited Away mm. Mm. it's really, so, it's yeah, really yeah, rewarding really, he really in terms likes of, yeah he really likes yeah. this aqua punk aesthetic. Everything is slightly <laughs> underwater. Not Def not yeah. entirely flooded, but you know, just enough to have a little boat to ride around in. Yeah, Panda Copanda. I'm surprised he's really never made cool. anything thing, set um, in Venice, you know. That seems he would love that. <laughs> I mean that, that's the thing with mm. Miyasaki. He has this this weird like apocalyptic ideation he sometimes like indulges yes. in a bit. <laughs> Like, uh, like it, you often hear me in interviews, like being the eccentric, uh, what was it, uh, Duma, Duma artist, uh, was the word, right? <laughs> yeah, that's the um, best idea. <laughs> yeah, to just, to just be, be like, oh man, I, you know what? I look forward to. Uh, I think like one direct quote, like that's really, really good, is is like, uh, like, like, um, J uh, Japan today is uh, like nowadays society is is too surface level. Uh, I look forward to the day when develop developers go broke, uh, 
J- Japan ends and wild grasses take over. Like, that kind of stuff he, like, l- l- likes to, like, mm-hmm. just put out there sometimes. And, and it's pretty clear that, like, there is some genuine misanthropy and, and like, longing for, for this, like, uh, revi- revitalization of pastoralism that might come with the end of modern civilization. But at the same time, there's this, there's this like, persistent hope in his uh, in his yeah. works that like keeps keeps like being there and keeps like uh, keeps him from like uh going like full doomer mode you know <laughs> so I, I speak. well yeah like even if we see all the way back to Nausicaa the world has ended but there's still always like a chance at life or also quite well in the journey of Shuna that we mentioned uh, yeah in the tales of Earthsea cast yeah like he he likes this idea that he, the world could maybe still end but we could still find a way there's still like a a hope uh, that's always yeah. there that i feel like yeah it burns through every time he gets too doomery yeah, yeah so, so that's i think one i think the, his statements yeah. in those kind of interviews and things like are honestly like i think that miyazaki is just a really dry guy and and <laughs> he just likes being a provocateur like uh, and so sometimes it, you can it it really does sound like he's serious but i'm not really sure if he's like really serious there's, i think yeah there's a nihilistic part to him but it never lets go of that hope yeah i, yeah. I guess that I mean, this is the narrative that we like hear about him a lot right this just this, this duality between being absolutely crushed by the world and being like, no, all to hell with it all. Ah. And on the other hand, like making the most hopeful, like optimistic future aware movies that still acknowledge real world problems. So don't turn into escapism. It's like, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But the one thing that I think best, ampl- uh, you know, expresses my- his mindset as well that he approached Ponyo with as well uh, to m- maybe wrap a neat bow around this and the Duma ide- ideation is in one interview he talked about a TV report that he's seen about a man whose house was completely destroyed by by a flooding. And he reported that this old man stood in front of his house laughing to the TV reporter and saying, well, ha, look, it's all broken. It's it's all fucked, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like all excited. And Miyazaki was like, wow, they, I want people My to be hero. like this. I want people to look at tragedy and laugh and be, and be able to play it off. Like, of course, like they are still suffering he explains right he explains at length like of course this is terrible for him but he kind of has the fortitude to despite his pain to be to be laughing about this and i think this is the sort of positive attitude to life that he wants to give to people with his films i genuinely yeah. believe that yeah yeah it's this laughing at tragedy but because there's there's almost a joy and excitement in in the possibility that is born of like the destruction of the old. Yeah. In the, a way. Yeah. The, the, this, this, yeah. The, the, this, this chaotic glee of uh, like, like the, the, that might be like why like the the Ponyo apocalypse is like the 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 most like sort of self indulgent apocalypse. It's, it's the sort of thing where like ha 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 look at this look at this let's <laughs> let's go. Let's point out all, all, all the, the like ancient fish that, for that these five years for some reason know the names of. Um, oh yeah, they do. Very, <laughs> like, very well read. Yeah, children, it was so yeah. funny. <laughs> yeah, like, like I, 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 I guess Sosuke is like just a prod, prodigy in more ways than one, huh? Yeah. Like, every every he, kid goes through the loving dinosaurs phase. It makes yeah, but sense. like this is like underwater dinosaurs. This is like yeah. specialist level. You it's know, Devonian. Yeah, it's like very weird names. Yeah, and, and it, it's it's kind of like like. Like kids also have like an and like ancient Egypt face maybe, but like they don't have like an ancient Mesopotamia face because that's like just a bit too obscure, right? right. It's just obscure right, enough is, to be weird. What Devonian do you mean, Japanese? Otaku. Japanese <laughs> children are all about Marduk and Tiamat and Ishtar. That's all what they learn. <laughs> Haven't you re- watched yeah. any anime? Like they are all into tarot. They're all into Mesopotamian gods. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I I concede. I concede. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no. But I, I, I was just g- gonna say that, like, even like the apocalyptic like vision of of, of the film is also tied to, to this joyous chaos of of childlike energy, um, which like it's just what the movie is like really, like aesthetically about at least, like just this ch- mentality of, uh, of of the child. And, and I think it's like too. It's, like, it's, it's there. Yeah. It's going in that. It's having that ability to choose, you know, new possibilities that that the adults don't have access to. Yeah, yeah, and, and it gets back to this 
uh, thing that I, I said earlier that like whereas my neighbor Totoro is like uh, is, is like embodying this childlike mentality, Ponyo is much more like about it uh, mm-hmm. in, in, in like more clear ways. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I I think like if uh, if if we're like about closing this this discussion out because like I, th- I think we've. We've talked for a long while. Um, yes, I, th- I think it's really interesting how, like, when when, when you've looked at uh, an artist like Miyazaki and, and his oeuvre, just the feature films, like th- even like ignoring uh, his uh, older stuff and uh, and series, um, it's it's really interesting how like he he comes back in Ponyo to a lot of like motifs and themes. Like we have the uh, the apocalypse and specifically w- regarding like water and flooding, and you have like this innocence of childhood uh you, you have have the relationship between like the new generation and the uh the, the parents and you have uh like the relate a, a core relationship between uh a, a young girl and young boy that's like not not quite romantic but like sort of represents this like potential um so that there's a lot of stuff that ju- and of course transformation uh, of 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 like body and mind, which is like a huge thing. Like the one thing that doesn't really factor into it, uh, uh, one theme that's gone like that fascinated Miyazaki from the start, that's not present here, is flight. <laughs> but that's we'll get true. to that. That's so true. There's no flight. I mean, there's underwater. There's kind of. Like swimming is kind of flying, but nah, that's true. There are helicopters at the end, yeah. but like he would, he would have to, yeah, he would have to save it up and then make his most flight movie of all time <laughs> next. Like, yes, he can't Very contain awesome. it anymore. Yeah, he uh, just couldn't hold it in. The most yeah. airplane movie there is. Okay, I will say though, Fujimoto's uh, little underwater, like his, his yeah, sort okay, of like that's uh, close. Uh, it's close. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's kind of. It's I believe it's actually like, based on um, what is it? Two Thousand Leagues Under the Sea, because uh, Fujimoto, the character, is based on a character in that. Who like? Oh yeah, that's like one. I don't remember exactly, but he's like there's a character who, yeah, who like leaves the crew to like like marry a a woman or something, and I guess that's what Fujimoto did. So yeah, it's a very Jules Verne kind of submarine. Yeah, when when he when he like goes into the uh, uh, to the chamber where he's like putting all the the. the ocean goo stuff into the well. <laughs> like there's what one of the one of the flasks has like marked like I think it's eighteen seventy one or yeah. something, which is right around the time that Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea took place. Oh, exactly. Oh, 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 oh. This movie just has too much. There's too much in this movie. Yeah, but there, there's even <laughs> a little bit more overlap just briefly, um, because Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea also had the theme of escaping from the world, because of course Captain Nemo kind of felt burnt by the world and got into some trouble. So it's like, nope, me and my crew, we just live under the sea. We we aren't mingling with humans anymore. And what they Down did instead... Downwards better, downwards better. Yeah, and when you live under the <laughs> sea like he like he did, you do exhibit some similar uh, personality traits to Fujimoto. One of the things that uh, uh, Captain Nemo and his crew got up to was to sit in front of the window and look at fish like crazy and have like tons of books about fish and obsess over fish and all that. Like it, it basically developed an intensely deep hobby and science and creative endeavor into fish. Um, So the parallels are, of course, there. A a, a piece of story where, like, people excuse themselves from the realm of the humans to live by the fish and obsess over fish. So (laughs) there we are. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Of course... 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, just as a little bit of Miyazaki context, was um, uh, uh, his inspiration for writing Nadia's Secret of the Blue Water, which he gave to Hideaki Anno to adapt into a TV series. Miyazaki came up with that idea, with that setting, which is basically a big old reference to 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, and made his friend Arno direct it, which goes into creating some of the context for when we will talk about his further collaboration with Arno on Wind Rises. Yeah. Uh, uh, also, nice. like, L- l- last thing I'll say there is just it's fascinating that, like right like towards the the tail end of his, his career, Miyazaki re- releases first like one of his most like childlike, wonderful and like straight up like magical, out with the rules type, uh, kids movie, and then follows that up with like one of his like most like his like definitely his most down to earth, um, but realistic and like morally complicated uh, film i think like that really shows the the, the range and depth of uh, of his work and i really look forward to talking about that one 
Although the next movie we will be covering is something else entirely, something new, a first again. We, we, it's been a while since we've had a first. Um, the next movie we're going to be covering is The Secret World of Arietti, directed by first-time director uh, at Ghibli, Hiromasa Yonobayashi. We've mentioned Yonobayashi at some points in, the, in, in previous episodes. He's also been a key animator on Ponyo. But with The Secret World of Arietti, he finally has gotten a chance to direct a movie for Studio Ghibli, which is going to be interesting again as we dive into yet another creator's, yet another director's work. And again... Uh, that's, the, that's the word creator. D don't use that Ooh, anymore. May uh, but maybe <laughs> Yonibashi likes to think of himself as a creator. We don't know. Huh. Yeah. Um, anyways, yeah, this is going to be the <laughs> next episode. I hope you will tune in next month when we hopefully, on schedule, will be releasing the Arietti episode. Um, and uh, other than that, I think we're finished here, and thanks for listening to the Nostacast. I hope you can also feel motivated to check out our Discord server, where we hope to soon be able to have enough people to actually kickstart some discussion and talking on there. Right now, a couple of people are coming in every few episodes. Not much talking yet. You could be the first one to really kickstart this, okay? So I'm I'm it, looking it, at it's you. Also like, it's also your opportunity to like ask us questions, because we, 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 we certainly like to talk about uh, Ghibli movies, if you haven't noticed. And other anime. I mean, I'm all over that shit, so uh, <laughs> just... Come hang out. Uh, tell us uh, how you hate what we talked about gender stuff in, in the Miyazaki movies. <laughs> or maybe don't. Come tell me how good my amazing analysis takes are. I yeah. like to hear it a lot. And if you want to help us pay the bills for keeping this podcast hosted <laughs> and maybe support our future audio recording quality, you can also consider giving us a bit of your well and hard earned money on Patreon at patreon.com slash Nausicast, which is written with two A's and not the umlaut uh, like it is in the titles. You know, I realized the umlaut is probably not good for branding, but, you know, it's there now. Um, the links are, of <laughs> course, all in the description of either your podcasting client or YouTube. Um... Okay, that's it. See you guys next time. Till then, goodbye. Bye bye. Bye bye. See ya. The little the little ponyo fish. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> also ham. 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 <laughs> <laughs>